Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Brownfield Grant Writing Training Webinar Series, Kickstart Your Application, hosted by the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality and the Kansas State University Technical Assistance to Brownfields Program. Today, we'll be presenting webinar number three, Community Need and Community Engagement. I'm Scott Nightingale with KSU TAB, and I'll be moderating today's session. We would like to thank the Louisiana Municipal Advisory and Technical Services Bureau, LAMAT, for sponsoring this webinar series and helping us reach municipalities across Louisiana. We will be muting everyone except for the speakers. However, just as a precaution, please go ahead and mute yourself individually as well. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during this webinar, please do so by using the group chat box. Just type in your questions, we will stop periodically during the webinar to answer them. The slides from this presentation, along with a recording of the meeting, will be available on the KSU tab website. It's important if you're using your phone for the audio connection that you turn off your computer audio. Otherwise, there might be feedback that gets through the system for everyone to hear. Audio settings in Zoom can be set by clicking the up arrow adjacent to the mute button. Also, please note the chat button near the bottom right. This will open the box in which you can ask questions or see the questions of others. Today's speakers are Rebecca Adi, Danielle Getzinger, and Jennifer Clancy. Rebecca is the Brownfield Coordinator at the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. She has successfully written several Brownfield Assessment Grant applications as well as some unsuccessful ones, gathering a list of lessons learned and grant writing insights. Returning from our last webinar to help finish those topics, Danielle Getzinger is a KSU TAB partner and the co-founder and CEO of Community Lattice, a consulting firm dedicated to overcoming the environmental barriers for advancing community revitalization. She has national experience working with various local governments, nonprofits, and economic development organizations to incorporate Brownfield's redevelopment strategies into area-wide planning efforts. She has written several successful EPA Brownfield's grants and serves as a grant reviewer for KSU TAB. Jennifer Clancy, the KSU TAB Region 7 Coordinator, has more than 10 years of experience in community redevelopment and revitalization, environmental assessment and cleanup, regulatory compliance, and grant management. She takes great pride in working with communities that have been historically underserved by assisting them with realizing their community vision and working to implement this vision in order to bring about meaningful and beneficial change. Formerly the program manager for the City of Houston's Brownfields Redevelopment Program, Jennifer established the program as an essential resource for advancing redevelopment and community revitalization efforts. During her tenure in Houston, she secured over $700,000 in EPA and other federal grant funding, as well as leveraged numerous other resources to provide assistance to Houston's underserved communities. General, Jennifer will provide some tips and insights on the community need and community engagement section of your application with suggestions for effectively engaging the community and relaying your plan for community engagement to EPA. Welcome to our third webinar in the Brownfield Grant Writing Training Series. Um, hopefully you've thought about your target areas and your priority sites, um, explored the U.S. Census website to start collecting demographic information, and pulled together some information on revitalization plans for your target area. Um, if not, that's okay. Uh, you still got plenty of time. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to finish up the project area description and plans for revitalization part of the application uh, by going over the strategies for leverage funding section with Danielle. And then we're going to tackle the community need and community engagement part of the proposal uh, with tips and tricks from Jen Clancy with KSU tab. Uh, this is where you're going to talk about why your area needs this funding and how the community is engaged in your brownfield process. Uh, community engagement, very high priority with EPA. Um, they don't just want the community to be informed of plans. Uh, they want to see that you're really involving the community in the decision-making process and setting up systems to collect their feedback on those potential plans. Uh, 
uh, as a reminder, uh, these webinars based on uh, the previous year's request for applications. Um, so the new request for applications expected to be issued uh, in late August uh, might have some changes to it, hopefully not significantly. Um, and then the sixth webinar is when we're going to go over to updates to the new request for applications. And you just want to make sure that you're following those guidelines when they come out. Um, each subsection we're going to go over today, I think they're all worth about five points. It's not going to sound like much, but we just received the scoring information from last year's grant, and it looks like the cutoff for the successful applications was 145 points out of 150. Um, so that's why we really emphasize that every point counts. All right. So in today's webinar, um, we're going to start with your strategy for leveraging resources. Um, the funding you're applying for, is there, it's only going to cover a portion of the project. We all know that. Um, EPA wants to know that you have the resources in place to move the site all the way to redevelopment and reuse, or you've at least thought through a plan to obtain those resources. Um, if you don't have a plan yet, don't worry. you got plenty of time to put one together. Um, this section is broken down into two subsections. Uh, first, you'll talk about the resources needed for site reuse, uh, and then you're going to discuss uh, how your priority sites are going to utilize existing infrastructure uh, and or what additional infrastructure might be needed to support the proposed reuse and what resources are available to install that infrastructure. Once we wrap up, part one of the narrative proposal. Um, we'll go through each section and subsection of part two of the application. Um, it seems in talking with uh, EPA and some of the debriefs that Scott's been on, um, this is a section where a lot of people lose points. So it's really worth putting in the effort to make sure each subsection is really solid. Um, we'll go over how to demonstrate and describe the community's need for the Brownfield funding. Um, this is basically your sob story. Why do you need this funding more than any other community? Uh, we'll also cover how to document threats to sensitive populations in your target areas and then relate them to brownfield assessments and cleanups and how those are going to help address those threats. Then we'll discuss community engagement, including identifying your local community project partners and describing their roles in your brownfield program, as well as developing effective methods for actively engaging the community for their input and how to communicate your efforts and plans to the reviewer. Um, as with previous webinars, and as Scott mentioned, we're going to have a short Q&A time after each subsection to answer a couple of questions, and then we'll have that longer Q&A at the end. Um, we really want these to be very interactive. We are here to help you and make sure that you feel comfortable in writing this application. Um, so please feel free to type in the, your questions to the chat box along the way. Um, if you're having technical difficulties with the chat or you do what I do and as soon as we end the webinar, you suddenly remember the question that you were going to ask, um, feel free to email us afterwards. We're here to help you even in between the webinars. All right, so let's start with um, section C. Uh, 1CI, Strategy for Leveraging Resources. Uh, so Danielle, would you like to go over what to include under resources needed for site reuse? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the last time, the, um, the last webinar, um, we went over an approach for evaluating the guidelines and writing relative to those guidelines. Um, and there is the ranking criteria section is what the EPA is asking for. And then if you continue on to the back, there's an evaluation criteria that matches up with that ranking criteria. So that is what they are evaluating you on. Um, so we've broken it out here, um, just like we did in the last webinar. Um, and so what they are looking for under this section um, is to describe the applicant's ability uh, for, for getting money, uh, basically, um, and other resources. Um, and then they're going to evaluate you on the extent to which um, you can get money. Um, and then they're going to be looking for um, how your grant will stimulate the availability of additional funds for environmental assessments or remediation, and the extent to which um, you can do that. Um, the, and then subsequent reuse, um, demolition activities, for example, um, redevelopment activities, 
um, of those priority sites. Um, so they're looking for that subsequent reuse, not just stopping at the remediation or the assessment. And then you're going to identify potential key funding resources that will be sought for using the assessment, remediation, and or reuse strategy uh, for the priority site. Um, so this is really the extent to which um, you've clearly identified um, those resources. Um, and these are just potential resources. You don't have to have these locked in. Um, it is helpful, of course, on a, on a cleanup grant, but we are looking right now at just this um, community-wide assessment grant. Um, one note that they do uh, make in here a couple of times is to not duplicate, duplicate the activities um, that you include in the task um, descriptions and activities. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So those, those activities, um, description of tasks and activities are what's being paid for under the grant. Um, and we're, we're making sure we're not duplicating that under the leveraged resources. So we're going to continue and talk about that. And we're going to talk about it right here. Oh, that was much faster than I thought. All right. So going back to there's the description of your tasks and activities. So again, that is paid for under the grant. So in part three of your application, you'll talk about how you're going to use the funding you're requesting um, and what activities you'll fund, what activities the grant will pay for. Um, and if you're going to use this grant to pay for an activity, then it doesn't count towards the leverage resources. Um, so, for example, if a prospective purchaser pays for a phase one assessment out of their own pocket and you do the phase two assessment under this grant, that phase one would count towards the leveraging funding or the leveraged funding. Um, but the phase two is paid for under the grant um, and you'd put that under the um, description of the tasks. So what they're asking for in this section is just the leveraged resources. You're going to talk about those descriptions later. Um, so do we have a note? Yeah. Um, so a note on those um, of you planning uh, on applying for multi-purpose or cleanup grants. Um, if you're applying for a multi-purpose grant, um, the last RFA included a required $40,000 cost share. Um, for cleanup grants, the cost share requirement was 20% of the requested funding. Um, so, for example, if you're applying for a $200,000 grant, you're required to, to put up that $40,000 cost share. Um, for those of you who are applying for multi-purpose or cleanup funding, any resources you'll say uh, you'll use as your cost share don't count as leveraged resources. This is a different category. Um, so if you have any questions on this, um, we, can, we can tackle them in the Q&A. Um, and KSU is always around um, to be able to, um, to, to answer those questions. Now, if you're applying for the assessment funding, which is really what this webinar is all about, um, the EPA is not requiring a cost share. Um, so that's really good news. Um, and um, that is actually really great news, especially for, for uh, if you're in a financial situation uh, where it's, it's difficult to come up with some additional uh, funding, especially nonprofits and local governments. Um, so I think I see some questions coming in, and we'll, we'll, we will answer those in the Q&A. Um, so leverage funding, just to recap, leverage funding um, is funding that you would um, not use under the grant, but is required for for the project in general. So you can count a lot of different things, like um, if the program gets a EDA grant, for example, um, or a CDBG grant um, to complete the project or infrastructure improvements, um, those things count under leverage funding. All right. Thank you, Danielle. Um, just FYI, uh, in the uh, request for applications under Section 4F, it actually is leveraging and it explains these out a little bit more. Um, one of the things I really recommend, make sure to send in uh, and take advantage of the review that Kansas State University can do. Um, they are really good at helping spot overlaps. So just they, they can go through and make sure that you don't double count something because um, it does get, I think the leverage resources versus description of tasks and activities, I think that's going to make more sense after the next webinar where we actually go through uh, your description of tasks and activities. Um, but just kind of know, they just make, want to make sure that you're not double counting it or counting it in different areas. 
All right. So um, I once worked on a project um, where the developer super appreciative of all the, the funding that we were providing. Um, but then I kind of figured out it was only like one, I think it was less than 1% of the total redevelopment cost. Um, so I kind of, I was feeling it was like a drop in the bucket. So I finally asked him about it. And he said that the first funding in for a project is always the hardest to get. And it's especially difficult to get that funding for a project when the environmental conditions are unknown. Nobody wants to invest at that point. Um, so even though the amount of funding was small, because we were taking, willing to take the risk early on um, and before the environmental issues were known, it was really key to then stimulating all the other funding uh, that came down the line for the actual redevelopment. Um, so Brownfield's money, it's early money. Um, so think about if once the environmental assessment is complete, what is that going to trigger? And that's your leverage funding. So this is my acorn and oak example. So Brownfield's funding, little tiny nugget of funding, uh, but then it can grow into this amazing project. So what are all the other parts of your amazing project um, that this little acorn of funding is going to help stimulate? And that's what you want to include in the section. All right, so you're going to talk about um, other funding and resources you have available to support the reuse of your priority sites. And this is going to help give EPA the confidence that they, if they invest in your sites, you have the additional resources to make sure that this is going to be a successful redevelopment project. So you want to think through the redevelopment of your priority sites. Um, what resources do you have committed or planned uh, planned already to complete the assessment work, the cleanup, and the redevelopment. Um, you know, if you're already working with a local developer who's involved in your project um, that's planning on funding the rest of the redevelopment, if that site's cleaned up, ask them, you know, how much do you plan on investing? And you really just need a ballpark figure for that. They can say, you know, this is what we're planning on doing and it's going to be a $70 million investment. There you go. Um, any potential sources for funding for future operations at the site. Um, let's say you're going to get a grant from the National Park Service um, to create a cultural museum, or you're partnering with a workforce development program to provide people with jobs or set up a job training center. You know, what are the dollar amounts that are associated with that for the actual operation down the line? Um, you want to also think about funding for infrastructure improvements. Um, you know, you might talk about that kind of in the next subsection that we're going to touch on, but it doesn't kind of hurt to think through, you know, what are all the things that can be triggered by this project. So you want to talk with your project par partners, help develop a list of what funding is already in place, what's in pro pro uh, progress, uh, and what are the potential sources of funding. Um, don't feel like you have to account for every penny or every piece of the project. Um, what you really want to do is provide enough information to give the reviewer confidence that you can pull the resources together for a successful project. Um, so like on this list, you want to think through, you know, what are the additional resources you have in place for the assessment, cleanup, redevelopment, the site purchase price can count as leverage funding, infrastructure improvements, uh, neighborhood improvements can count too because that can help attract investors. Um, and then thinking through what's in place, what's in progress, and what are some potential sources. All right, so let's go over an example. Um, let's see. So your, let's say your phase one assessment was paid for by your prospective purchaser. That can count as leverage funding. Uh, phase two environmental assessment that's paid for by this grant, um, not leverage funding. Uh, but everything else, you know, you have a cleanup plan um, that's developed by somebody else's brownfield program. Um, let's say you're a city and you're partnering with the, with the parish or the planning commission that also has a brownfield program. If they're going to help contribute to that, that can count as leverage funding as well. Um, cleanup, uh, if you're going to apply for an EPA cleanup grant or uh, a loan, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that can count as leverage funding. Um, like we mentioned before, redevelopment of the property, street improvements, you know, you get a grant to put in a fresh food grocery store that's from some federal partner, all that can count as leverage resources. Uh, one thing I did want to note underneath the cleanup, 
Um, so in Louisiana, there are two brownfield cleanup revolving loan funds. Um, one is housed at South Central Planning and Development Commission. Um, it's been around for a while. They were just awarded additional funding. They do a great job with that. They cover roughly the southwest, south central part of the state from Lake Charles to Baton Rouge and down to Homa Thibodeau area. Um, and then LDEQ, um, we were just awarded a Brownfield Revolving Loan Fund grant, um, which should be up and running by spring 2021, so well before you would get this funding. Um, and we pretty much cover the rest of the state. Um, so both of these, you can, if, depending on what geography you're in, you can note those as leveraged funding as well. Um, if you're in the Southwest, South Central part of the state, uh, you might wanna just touch base with Leslie Long with South Central, uh, and she can kind of help you decide if your priority sites would be eligible for their RLF. Um, if you're in any other part of the state or you're not eligible for their RLF, you can note the LDEQ's $800,000 uh, revolving loan fund as a potential funding source for cleanup. Um, just keep in mind, what you're putting in here is conceptual. Um, so it's not a firm commitment of funds, but you're saying these are the potential sources that are available. Okay, so when I first started with Brownfields, I didn't really appreciate the breadth of leverage funding uh, until I went to an EPA Brownfield regional meeting and uh, EPA very smartly handed out awards for the various categories for leverage funding. They included, you know, lever most leverage funding overall, most leverage project on one project, most sources of leverage funding. Um, and what I did is I talked with those folks afterwards to find out um, what they were including as leverage funding and realized it's pretty much anything that contributes to the success of the project. Um, so we had a bunch of leverage funding. I just wasn't good at categorizing it that way. Um, but now we're going to go over some examples, uh, and I know there's a lot, uh, but I wanted to get you thinking about the possibilities that you, you might be able to include in this section. So don't feel like you have to include them all. I'm just kind of throwing these out there to help get those um, ideas going. So examples include the property purchase price, like we mentioned before. Even if it's donated, that still has value, so you can count that as a leverage resource. Um, any investment by the private developers or investors for the redevelopment, um, you know, things like developing their plans, marketing the site, um, doing their due diligence work as part of the real estate transaction, um, all that kind of stuff. Talk to your development partners and they can help you with that. Um, don't forget about traditional financing, like bank loans uh, for the purchase and or redevelopment of the sites. Um, tax credits can also count as leverage funding. Um, historic tax credits, affordable tax credits, new market tax credits, those are all ones that are um, help fund the reuse of brownfield sites. Um, if, even if you don't have them secured, if the priority sites are eligible for them, you can note that as well. Um, or saying, you know, the developer is working to secure them, something like that. Uh, many local communities also provide community development block grant funding for brownfield projects. Uh, brownfield sites might also be located in a tax increment finance district. Um, and if you have numbers to attach to that, you know, they're going to get so much in a CDBG funding or um, something related to your TIF district, you know, up to a certain amount, you know, include those as well. Um, leverage resources can also include federal funding. Remember, this is leverage resources, not cost share. So it can include federal funding, uh, like from the Economic Development Industry Administration, from HUD. Um, USDA actually has a good amount of, of funding related to brownfield sites, especially in rural areas, uh, and disaster recovery funding as well, which I think we're going to see more and more of, especially with the COVID uh, outbreak and recovery. Um, EPA local foods, local places, that's another common one um, to address food deserts and redevelop brownfield sites and grocery stores. Uh, National Endowment of the Arts funding, that can support artists and also can help incorporate art into brownfield reuse projects. Uh, you can also include infrastructure improvements. You know, think about are there roadway improvements happening in your target area? You know, 
that's a big thing for developers is what, what's the road network system to get to and from the site. So if there are roadway improvements that then help attract the investment into your target area, that can help as well. Uh, you know, are they upgrading broadband? Uh, are there sewer improvements planned? Is the city installing improving sidewalks, putting in multimodal paths or bike lanes? You know, these can all help with attracting developers uh, and facilitate the reuse of your priority site. Okay, so we, we kind of debated this one a little bit. Uh, in the past, we have included in this section uh, community outreach and community involvement, um, uh, cost share, and as well, or leverage funding. Um, you know, KSU tab, their services, they can help you with some of the community outreach. And we've counted that in this section, but it seems like EPA has reformulated this section, so it's more concentrated on site reuse. Um, so if you have the space, I don't think it hurts to include a couple sentences about leverage funding you have to ensure the community is involved in and has opportunities to provide input into the site reuse. Um, this can be like your community partner time to assist with outreach or donated meeting space. Um, I can't really say EPA is gonna award you points for it, but it's always good to include community involvement when you can. Um, another option though is to include that in your actual activities section. Um, and just remember, you just don't wanna double count that. All right, so the tip for this section, if you can include amount, amounts if possible, uh, you know, what's the anticipated development cost? Um, what's the total amount of local foods, local places grant you received? Um, you can note LDEQ's $800,000 cleanup revolving loan fund. You know, if, if it's possible, try to quantify those numbers. All right, so here's the next steps for this section. Um, think through the reuse of your priority sites and then uh, brainstorm your ideas for leverage resources. So a great place to look at that is other plans or studies for your target area. A lot of times they'll note um, some resources or what's already been going on in that target area, so that can help. Um, contact your local partners for ideas. Uh, see what they've already had planned or, or, you know, what would they contribute if the site was redeveloped, what can you might be able to, might be eligible for. Uh, and then add leverage uh, resources to your priority sites table uh, and make sure that you're quantifying whenever possible. All right, so tip for this section, this is really a great guide. EPA puts together a Brownfields Federal Programs Guide. It's basically what are all the other federal programs out there that can help support the reuse of brownfield sites. Um, at the beginning of this document, there's a summary table in the front uh, that helps you identify what the funding can be used for and to see if it aligns with your site reuse. Um, so that's a great resource to look through to identify potential sources of funding. And then also for this section, think aspirationally. Um, so none of this funding really needs to be set in stone. Uh, remember that the guidelines say potential funding sources EPA recognizes that it might be difficult to secure the resources this early on, uh, but they want to know that you're thinking about the project all the way through the redevelopment and reuse and have a plan to get to a successful project. All right, Danielle, I think you mentioned that there were a couple of questions. Did we want to take those? Was there anything? I think Scott, that Scott, Scott got them. Okay. They're more administrative. All right, so we're going to move on. We'll, we'll still do our other Q&A section, but uh, finishing up part one uh, is subsection two, which is use of existing infrastructure. Um, this is again worth five points. It's a pretty easy five points. Uh, pretty much any brownfield project is going to utilize existing infrastructure. Uh, you just need to make sure to clearly state this. So Danielle, do you want to go over what to include in this section? Yeah, and I just want to um, hit on your, your easy five points. Um, this is easy five points, but there's a lot of people that miss it. Um, and as Rebecca mentioned in the beginning, five points can make or break uh, your, your application. So definitely get this one. Um, so again, the writing approach, the ranking criteria um, relative to the evaluation criteria, 
Uh, we're describing how this grant will uh, facilitate the use of existing infrastructure um, at the priority sites and, and cross out any ORs uh, within your target area. Um, so the evaluation is just the extent to which you're doing that. Um, and then if additional infrastructure is needed, um, what, what are your plans to basically secure funding um, and, and make that uh, a non-issue for, for redevelopment? Okay, so think about, um, as, you, as you're going through your, your um, grant application, think through uh, what your proposed redevelopment plans might need um, and state that they'll use existing infrastructure. So like the building itself um, can count um, and then specifically utilities um, like sewer, water lines, roads, broadband, electrical lines, for example. Um, and if there are needs to improve those lines, um, or any of those utilities or the infrastructure, um, what is available, um, either programs that are currently in place, um, a city um, might already have a master plan um, to upgrade all the sewers, he's gonna wanna mention that. Um, there's um, local TIF districts um, often um, focus on infrastructure to incentivize development, um, or maybe even identifying some of those leverage resources um, to, to upgrade those, um, those utilities. Um, so to make sure you list them out, be very specific. This is where people lose points. They, um, some people just say, well, use existing infrastructure. It's there. Um, that's not enough. Um, you need to be very specific. Um, so, you know, also align that with what your project um, is. So for example, if you're proposing a tech hub, you know, do you have enough broadband to support that? And if not, uh, look into potential funding sources like the USDA, um, you know, noted in this section, like the USDA um, or other, you know, EDA also, um, TxDOT, oh, I'm sorry, not TxDOT, whatever the Louisiana um, <laughs> Department of Transportation. Sorry, I'm in Texas, my Texan is showing. Um, so other funding, uh, CDBG, uh, Regional Planning Commissions uh, for transportation funding. Um, you might want to also look through previous plans and studies. Um, to see what they've mentioned. Um, if, you can, if you can tap into that, that's always great. Um, you can also request funding from the, through the grant application for planning activities, um, specifically performing uh, infrastructure assessments. Um, so you can mention that here. Um, but you can also, uh, we would recommend that you do a little bit of research um, into those potential funding sources, um, include some of those here so you can show that you've done um, your homework. Um, and like Rebecca had mentioned that, um, that federal programs guide is a really great place to start. All right, thanks, Danielle. Um, all right, so our next steps for this section, uh, list out what existing infrastructure your projects were utilized. Uh, make a list of any additional infrastructure improvements that might be needed for your planned reuses and re research some potential funding sources for that. Uh, and then add that information gathered to your priority sites table. Um, and just make sure we're to highlight this. If you say your sites are going to need infrastructure, include your plan for that and your potential funding sources. Um, I recommend you don't include everybody's infrastructure needs to be upgraded. I think that's pretty much a given. Um, so I wouldn't mention that if it's just the general upgrades. Um, just really focus on anything that's related to the reuse of your sites. Um, that's going to be glaringly obvious to an EPA reviewer that you might need an infrastructure upgrade. Um, it is perfectly acceptable that you just say you're going to use, you know, the in existing infrastructure and again list all those out. Um, you do not need to include uh, um, any infrastructure improvements that might be needed. Um, and, but like I said, unless it's glaringly obvious from whatever redevelopment, it's a much higher use than what was there before. Uh, you know, you're putting in a Google uh, cloud station, obviously you're gonna need more electricity and that type of thing. But if it's not glaringly obvious, you might think twice about uh, whether to include that or not. Um, so just make sure that that's uh, included. 
Rebecca, if I could add to, this is also a good section um, to, if you are improving any of the um, energy efficiency, um, it's a, might be if you're planning on solar panels um, or you're planning to upgrade storm stormwater um, to be a little bit more eco-friendly, um, this is not a, this is a good place to mention that um, and then reinforce that in later in your um, grant application because the EPA likes that stuff. Or if they're already planning on improving the streets in the area, that's this is a good place to put it. Uh, that that's a good point, Danielle. All right, so we made it to the end of part one. Woohoo! Um, so let's go through Scott. Any questions that came in that you want to uh, address for everybody? We have none. All right. Anything else? I saw one from Janet from the beginning about target area. Um, should targets, all the target areas identified have a priority site identified as well? I would say yes, but anybody else can say differently, but from, from what I've done in the past, every target area I've had has at least one priority site. It might be a small site, uh, when we applied for the revolving loan fund, we had, you know, a couple of bigger sites that were in the downtown areas, but our third uh, target area was the rural communities, and I think we included like a gas station, um, just one small site in that, but I would, I would recommend including at least one priority site in each of your target areas. Any, Scott, Danielle, Jennifer? I agree. Okay. Definitely do that. All right. All right. And let's keep going with section two. All right. So now that we're all caught up, um, any more questions for Danielle? Last time, because we're going to let her go a little early since she's stuck with us. All right. Thank you. And I think that my information is at the end of the webinar, so feel free to reach out to me directly if anybody does have any questions. She's a great resource and someone uh, who's really good to contact to bounce ideas off of, just FYI. All right. Okay. So now that we're caught up, uh, let's move on to the community need and community engagement part of your application. Um, this is where we're going to talk about your community's need for this funding. Why do you need this? Uh, and how you plan to actively engage the community in your Brownfields program. Okay, so in section 2A, you're going to talk about your community's need for this funding. This is basically your sob story. You know, how are Brownfields negatively impacting your community? How are they affecting your economy? And how are they especially impacting your sensitive populations? Um, and why does your entity lack any other resources to address the environmental concerns at brownfield sites? So why do they need this funding specifically? Um, note, this section should match up with part one of your application, um, specifically your description of priority brownfield sites and uh, the outcomes and benefits of reuse strategy subsections. Um, so let's say, you know, your priority sites have environmental concerns such as lead. Then in this section, you might want to talk about how your community has been impacted by lead poisoning and how that affects students' mental capabilities in school, which then can lead to, you know, reduced job opportunities because they don't get as good of an education. And then that leads to the demise of your community. Or if you have asbestos concerns, you know, this is where you're going to talk about cancer rates, such as mesothelioma, um, how that prevents people from working, that reduces their income, that exacer and exasperates their access to health care, um, that decreases the income tax revenue from the municipality, which then is going to lead to the demise of your community as a whole. Um, let's say in this section you talk about um, that blight and reduced property tax revenue really limit your resources to address additional brownfield sites. You know, then in your outcomes section in part one, you're, you're going to want to note how addressing these brownfield sites is going to reduce blight, generate tax revenue for the municipality, which can then be used for other community improvements, and then make it the utopia that you talked about in part one. 
Um, so as you can tell, it's very much an iterative process. There's normally a good back and forth as you write your proposal just to make sure things line up. Um, again, this is where a, a review by Kansas State's uh, TAB program can really help. Um, they can make sure that things match up and they can also make suggestions for connections. Um, I gotta be honest, this is one of the things I struggle with is making sure my narrative is the same throughout and having that KSU review really helps with that. All right, second tip for this section, don't hold back. So in my first grant proposal, I really had issues with painting the picture of our community, that it was in desperate need. I kind of wanted to show that our community could pull themselves up from their bootstraps. They just needed a little help. Um, but that didn't really go over well when my proposal was then compared to others that said they were in desperate need of this funding. Um, so this is really where you want to lay it all out there how bad things are, all the negative effects on Brown, of, that you have from Brownfield, and how much your community really needs this funding more than anybody else. Um, Jen, I think you have an example of that as well. Yeah, I just want to add on, um, you know, what you just said about this section being your sob story. And, you know, you have to really tell the reviewers why you so desperately need this money. So this is this is not a time to paint a rosy picture or you know to try to sugarcoat your situation because you know you know what happens if you do that you're not going to get funded. Um, I wrote a proposal you know quite a while back where I highlighted all these budget shortfalls within the city organization over several years and how this led to all these layoffs and closing of parks and community centers. And, you know, it was horrible, terrible. We were in this just, you know, terrible situation. We needed money so bad. And um, I was told by pe the people higher up in my supervisory chain that um, I couldn't write all those things in the proposal because it made the city look really bad. And, you know, my mistake was that I listened to them uh, because they were my superiors. So, you know, clearly they knew more than me, right? Um, so that was a big wrong, a big, big no-no. Um, I took all that stuff out that made the city look bad. And then, you know, guess what happened? My proposal didn't get funded. So these are competitive, very competitive. And EB EPA wants to make really sure that your community needs this money. So this is not a time to sugarcoat like I did or a time to show that, you know, your community just needs a little bit of help like Rebecca did. Yeah, that's, and, and we're emphasizing this because a lot of us aren't very good about airing our dirty laundry, but this is where you kind of want to let it all hang out. All right, so let's start with subsection 2AI, the community's need for funding. Um, so in this section, EPA is asking you to describe how this grant is going to meet the needs of your community, talk about why your community doesn't have any other initial sources of funding to carry out environmental assessment or remediation, uh, and, this, and the subsequent reuse of the target area. Um, and note this, because of the small population and or low income of the community. Um, so you're going to be evaluated on the degree to which the the community that will benefit from this grant is of small population and or low income and the extent to which either of these characteristics limit the community's ability to obtain initial funding and carry out the environmental remediation and subsequent reuse. Um, so notice that both the ranking criteria and the evaluation criteria um, talk about small population and low income communities. So make sure you really want to clearly state, uh, including some backup data, that your community fits uh, either into the small population category or the low income uh, category, or like we mentioned before, preferably both. Um, as we mentioned, if there's an or, you really want to try to make it an and. Um, you really want to make sure that you can adequately cover um, both parts if you do make it an and. Uh, Scott was saying <coughs> he was at a session at the National Brownfield Conference uh, where reviewers said that they actually took away points because an entity tried to cover both uh, categories where there was an or um, and they didn't really do a good job with one of them. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that approach since it's an, it's an and or an or so if you cover one you should get full points. 
Um, and they did cover one of the two well, but you know, I'm not the EPA reviewer. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, process isn't totally objective. So just make sure you're doing your best to cover all your bases. So if you can do small population and low income, and you have the data to back that up, I encourage you to do so. But if you can only do one or the other um, and have the data to back it up, then I would, I would make sure just to do one or the other. Um, I think this is also a really good example of why it's important to read both the ranking criteria and the evaluation criteria. Um, the evaluation criteria is very clear that you're going to be evaluated on the degree to which the community is of small population and or low income. Um, so really to get the points in this section, your target community should fall into one of those categories. Uh, I don't think personally it's as obvious in the ranking criteria section. Um, so that's why it's really good to read both of those sections. We're going to talk about small populations and low income more on the next few slides. Um, just make a note, this is what EPA emphasized last year. Since the administration hasn't changed, I wouldn't expect that these um, priorities would change next year. Um, but as with the rest of the RFA, uh, just make sure to double check and see what EPA is specifically asking for in this section when the new RFA comes out. Uh, and then just as a reminder, make sure to address the need for funding in each of your target areas. Um, so that's again where you want to concentrate on what are the stats for your specific target areas. Okay, so let's talk about small population. I couldn't for the life of me, I've never been able to find an actual definition of what qualifies as a small population as it relates to these requests for applications. Uh, last year's guidance didn't include it, uh, and it also didn't really define what geography to use to make that determination. Um, so this can be the size of your town or village, it can be the neighborhood that you're working in, it can be your target area. Um, I recommend choosing whatever works for your application, just to demonstrate it's a small population. At a minimum, I would state the population of your target area and how that area has limited resources to address brownfield. If the target area <coughs> sorry, uh, is in a small municipality with limited tax revenue, I would include the municipality's population and talk about uh, their limited revenue as well. Uh, if the parish that you're in also has a small population compared to the rest of the state, you could mention that too. Um, be sure to include the actual population numbers uh, and note that they're from the U.S. Census. Hopefully that's where you're getting your information from. Uh, but like I said, just make sure to, to uh, include qualitative and quantitative in the, in, throughout your proposal. So make sure to include your population numbers in this section as well. All right, so once you have your geography, you're gonna wanna note why your population should be considered small. Um, so this doesn't have to be extensive just a sense or two that compares your population to other similar geographies or talks about how much your population has declined since its heyday. Um, if it's a rural community or small town, you might wanna mention that too. Um, one of the things, uh, just a side note, no municipality in Louisiana was large enough to qualify for direct funding under the CARES Act. Um, so while other COVID related funding might be available to municipalities later on, um, it might be worth noting this just to show both the economic plight and the small population size. And they didn't qualify because no, none of our municipalities were large enough to qualify. Um, one tip for this section, I did a Google search and found out the average county parish size, um, which took me to a Wikipedia page. Uh, it said that the average county size in the U.S. is 104,000 roughly and the average Louisiana parish size is about 73,000. Uh, so you can show this, show that your parish is smaller than the average county in the U.S. and if possible, smaller than most Louisiana parishes, if that applies. Uh, Wikipedia also provides a parish information table, so you can sort it by population, so you can do a comparison, like we're in the you know, bottom 10% population size for Louisiana parishes or, you know, our city is this size compared to other places. Uh, mentioning it, because Google can be a great 
resource for finding key information quickly and to find those comparisons rather than trying to, you know, sort through the census and figure that out. So don't be afraid to use Google for this. However, my tip though, please don't you don't cite Wikipedia uh, as your resource. Um, make sure if you are going to use Google and it brings up a Wikipedia page, uh, don't cite Wikipedia. Um, see whatever they're referencing. In this case, it was the U.S. Census and cite that as your source. I did see that in a couple applications, which is why I'm noting it here. All right, so next steps for this slide include uh, choose your geography for determining your, your small population uh, and then determine your population numbers, most likely with the U.S. Census information. Um, this might be a kind of an iterative process. You might want to, you know, see the census and see what else might be able to make your argument. If you've already started your demographic table uh, with this information for your target area and the municipality that it's located in, uh, you're already done with these two steps. Um, the final step, gather information to compare your population to others uh, and or document the decline to show that it's a small population. So just come up with something to demonstrate why they should consider it a small population. All right, Jen, would you like to talk about low income? I would love to. Um, so this section is about community need, like this, this whole bigger section we're talking about, right? So um, it's going to be hard to make a compelling case that your community needs funding if your target area is also a low income area. So, you know, what are some ways that you can demonstrate low income and how that affects community need? You know, so there's the obvious, um, you know, more obvious median household income or per capita income. Um, include statistics about median household income or per capita income for your target area. And whenever possible, compare those numbers to the city or the parish, uh, the state and the country. Um, you can acknowledge the percentage of the target area population living at or below poverty and how that compares to the surrounding areas by saying something like, you know, this is a community in which nearly 40% of residents live at or below poverty rate, which is greater than the city and state averages and two and a half times the national average. So you can incorporate a lot of information um, into one, you know, sort of complex sentence. Um, Unemployment and underemployment rates are obviously um, a great indicator of low income and community need. So not only who doesn't have work, but who doesn't have enough work. Um, it's important when you're writing about this that you're not just giving statistics alone. You know, target area has a 13% unemployment rate, therefore we need this money. Tie this back to your narrative. You know, the, 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 what's the story that you're trying to tell? Um, you've got only so many pages to tell a compelling story. So, you know, again, tie your statistics together as much as possible and create some of these really powerful sentences that don't take up a whole lot of page space. And um, if your community has had job losses all across the board, why are these lost jobs more painful for your target area? Uh, don't just give the statistics. Make it personal by saying something like, you know, these losses have been devastating to areas like the target area, which has an unemployment rate of nearly 13 percent. You know, that's higher than the local, state, and national averages, as well as a population in which um, 38 percent live at or below the poverty limit, which is roughly two and a half times that of the national average. Okay, that's a, that's a lot of sentence there, but um, there's a lot of compelling information tied into it. Some other indicators you can consider are uh, the median house value or the percentage of renters. You know, is your community a severe distressed community? Are you in an enterprise zone? Um, what percentage of residents receive SNAP assistance? You know, spend some time exploring the data on the US Census data page that Rebecca went over on the last webinar and see what other types of information are available and how it can tie back to your community story and demonstrate your level of need. Um, also, if your target is in an opportunity zone, chances are really good you already demonstrate all, uh, all or most of these things. You know, however, you still need to spell it out. It's not simply enough to say that the target area is in an opportunity zone. Um, although, you know, you should remind the reviewers of this any chance you get. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like we said before, the more, uh, the more places you can insert in opportunity zone, uh, the better for your application. 
All right. Um, so this is just one way of how, how I do this when I'm going through the application. Um, I pull out my demographic table um, that I started from the last webinar and add on to it. Um, again, this is not a required part of your application. Um, at least it wasn't last year. Uh, it's just a tool for helping you write your application. Uh, what data is going to be useful to tell the story of your target area and demonstrate a small or declining population and economic need? Um, are there ways of presenting that data that present a more compelling case? So some of the things you know that uh, Jen mentioned, um, get fancy here. Um, you know, you might want to note the median household income or uh, I think I've got this, yeah, percent of households with SNAP benefits. You know, things that are going to really show your need and include your, your obviously your population from before, unemployment, the different types of unemployment that you had from before, um, you know, really kind of flesh this out for your target areas, uh, for the municipalities that they're in, um, and for the, the state and the United States as a whole. Um, I've also seen in other applications that they compare it to similar sized geographies in other states or other areas um, that's kind of going above and beyond, but if you have nothing else to compare it to, that might be good too. All right, if you are applying for an assessment coalition grant, um, you're also going to need to, to describe how this funding uh, will serve the coalition partners and the communities that would otherwise not have access to resources to address brownfield sites. Um, so as with the regular assessment grants, uh, it should include information on how each target area uh, and how it fits into the small population and or low income category um, and how that limits each target area's ability to address brownfield. So just make sure, again, include information on each target area. Addition, include information on why each coalition member uh, doesn't have these resources to address brownfield sites. Um, just want to make sure you're including it on, um, you know, why each of the entities that are applying, why none of them have the resources to address these brownfield sites. All right, Jen, would you like to talk about other things to consider? Yeah, so um, we've covered the pretty obvious ways that you can demonstrate that your community needs funding. Uh, you know, community income, poverty rates, unemployment, things like that. But let's touch real quick on some of the other things you should consider or weave into your story that may help paint the picture of need um, even more. So um, to this point, we've mostly just talked about the economics of the target area. But I'm assuming many of you work for a local or regional government agencies or um, you know, a nonprofit that is dependent on other sources of funding. So talk a little bit about that, the economic conditions of your organization. And you know, remember how I mentioned I lost a grant by pulling out all this stuff that made the city look bad financially? You know, well, that grant was for a much smaller target area than the city of Houston, but because I was writing as the city of Houston, I always included information about the city as a whole, in addition to the specific target area. So what are some of the other things that can also be included? Okay, have you been affected by a natural disaster? They don't really give special consideration for natural disasters anymore since they're happening everywhere all the time. Um, however, natural disasters have a huge financial impact on state, regional, and local governments and nonprofit organizations. You know, Houston suffered roughly $50 billion in losses in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and even though we didn't get special consideration for having a natural disaster, there is no denying that $50 billion is a huge economic hit and definitely affected the city's ability to help fund this grant project that I was trying to get funded. Um, so if you've been affected by a natural disaster like flooding, tropical storms, hurricanes, anything like that in the past four or five years, to mention that economic impact. Okay, what about uh, large-scale industry or job losses? You know, the oil and gas market took a big hit this year. How did that impact uh, your community or the region as a whole? And what impact did it have on your target area if they're already an area with higher than average unemployment? You know, obviously oil and gas aren't the only options here. So, you know, think about your region and, and what's been going on big picture. 
Yeah, I know you mentioned that's not the only thing, but that's a big thing in Louisiana, and most of our communities really were were impacted with that as well as the state as a whole. Yeah, it's a big thing, and so I, I know, especially you know, in Texas and Louisiana, that is a huge thing. Um, so definitely look at it, but I'm saying also, you know, look at some other factors too, and don't be bummed out if you know your community wasn't economically didn't take an economic hit because of this oil, you know, the oil loss, right? There may be something else that that um, hit your hit your job economy. Okay, so what's going on with foreclosures, tax delinquent properties, or vacant properties in your area? You know, these have a significant economic impact, uh, not only because they may represent lost unemployment opportunities, but they also represent lost tax revenue for the city and the target area, which you know, that has a very direct effect on the amount of financial resources coming into a community. Okay, and COVID-19, you know, um, how has that impacted the financial need in your community? So we're still sort of in the middle of this, this whole COVID thing. So the full financial impacts won't be able to be fully realized for quite a while. But um, think about what you already know and include statements like, you know, COVID resulted in X percentage increase in unemployment in our area, uh, which already had an un unemployment rate higher than the state or national average. Or, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has resulted in X number of businesses shuttering. Um, and also think about the target area population. Uh, mm -hmm. is, that, is that a demographic group that was hit harder or was um, more susceptible to COVID? All right, so quick recap. Um, when you're talking about your com community's need for funding, make sure you convey the small population and the low income of your target area by discussing things like the size of your community, if the population is declining, income levels, and poverty and unemployment rates. Tie all of that back into how this relates to the limited resources you have for conducting assessments, doing cleanups, and planning for reuse of sites. And above all, you make sure you're telling your story. Mm -hmm. Most of the communities that are applying for these grants have similar statistics and similar situations, but how you relate the dire situation while telling the story of your community is what's going to get your proposed, set your proposal apart from the rest. All right, and one tip for this section. Uh, most brownfield areas face really similar struggles so while you want your proposal to stand out, don't be afraid of including struggles that other areas might be facing, like natural disasters or COVID-19 repercussions. Just be, um, just be sure to clearly state how these affected your community and your ability to address the brownfields in your target area. All right, um, quick sound check. Uh, uh, Kim mentioned I'm cutting in and out, and Scott, you said I'm a little fuzzy. Do, do I sound okay now? I tried to move cords around. Is that better? Uh, better. Um, perhaps still a little fuzzy. I think it's about as good as it's going to be. Um, yeah. Um, Talk slow. It's better. So, Jen, you were a little fuzzy too. So. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> All right, then we're going to blame you, Scott. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's the list of the next steps for this section. Um, first, you want to choose your geography or your geographies to show your target area has a small population and or is low income. Um, and research the demographic information to back up that, those claims, including comparing it to other geographies. Uh, and then write out your sob story. Bring out the hanky for this one. Uh, so why do you need this funding more than anybody else? Remember, don't hold back, um, and why does your entity, organization, target area not have the funds to address brownfield sites due to either small population or low-income populations or both? Um, after you've drafted your sob story, think about what additional data or information might help you demonstrate your need, and then add that to your demographic table and to your narrative. All right, so time for a Q&A and a quick stretch break. Um, we're encouraging you to get up, move your hands around, stretch above. We know these are long, so make sure you're keeping your circulation going. Um, 
while uh, Scott, any um, questions that came in? Nope, nothing additional to the sound quality questions. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to just add, Scott, you're a little fuzzy too, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. If there's anything, if there's any point where you didn't understand what we said, um, go ahead and, and type that into the chat box and just um, kind of give us a little reference. If you look in the bottom left hand corner, it has the slide number. So if there's something that you missed, just make sure to note that slide number and we can go back to that and review it again just to make sure everybody's getting the information that they need. All right. So uh, the next section is community need, threats to sensitive populations. Uh, this is where you're gonna talk about all the negative effects that your brownfield sites have had on your community. Uh, so for this section, I think when we talked about the utopia in part one, I told you put on that you know Pollyanna hat and this is the great things that's gonna happen. All right, you're gonna take that Pollyanna hat off, stick it in the drawer, close the drawer, Take out your drama hat for this to highlight all the terrible things that are happening in your target area. You know, what's going wrong in your city, your town, your parish, your state. Um, it can get a little depressing, but that's okay. You really want to paint why is your community need this funding more than anybody else. Um, and think about it as the darkest point before the dawn, uh, with the dawn being the utopia that you talked about in part one. So in this subsection, you want to make sure to answer um, um, what are your community's struggles, your threats, your issues, you know, what's the data to back that up? How specifically will this grant help address those struggles and threats and issues? Okay, you want to make it very, very obvious how this funding will specifically help address those needs. Um, so you're going to tell EPA how this funding is going to, uh, and the redevelopment of your priority sites will specifically address the needs that you state throughout this section. Um, we're going to go into each section and flesh this out a little more, as well as give you some examples of how to do this. Uh, this seems to be something that people uh, lose points on because they state all the issues, uh, but they don't specifically state how this funding is going to help. Um, make sure you're including that. Um, and just uh, as a note for this section, you see at the very bottom, um, it says, please refer to the fiscal year 20 uh, FAQs for information on welfare. Um, since they mentioned it, we're gonna just kind of bring it up here as an FYI. Uh, each year, EPA develops a frequently asked questions document that goes along with the Brownfield RFA. Um, this is where they give you a little more insight onto what they're looking for um, and kind of the nuances of it. I'm going to be honest with you, I've never read the thing in the entirety. However, I do search it for specific terms and look up specific sections that I think are going to help me understand the RFA better. Um, if you have the time, it is a very helpful read to better understand what EPA is looking for. Uh, and we included a link to that document uh, the one for last year in the next steps and useful links document. It really does have some great nuggets of information to help you um, craft your proposal. All right, so first um, let's define what are sensitive populations. Um, we're going to go over some options, uh, but please don't feel like you need to include them all um, or that these are the only options. These are just some examples to get you thinking about what sensitive populations might be in your target area. Um, when we talked to EPA earlier, they said it's good to include maybe three or four uh, different sensitive populations and kind of flush out the, the picture of your target area. Um, so according to that EPA FAQ document, sensitive populations include uh, children, uh, pregnant women, minority groups, low income populations, adults over 65, um, and other sensitive groups subject to environmental exposures, uh, which is basically a catch-all term for uh, any other sensitive groups that you might have in your particular target areas. Um, the FAQ document also notes that sensitive populations 
include individuals exposed to multiple chemical and non-chemical stressors. Uh, so you can add these in as, as I, I would uh, add this in kind of as land here, um, but include some of the groups from the previous slides as well. So kind of a good mix of these. Um, so let's kind of talk about what these two categories mean. So this includes people who are exposed to cumulative environmental impacts uh, from multiple sources of contamination uh, or have been exposed to environmental contamination for an extended period of time. Um, so like for instance, this can include people who, who live in an area that has a lot of historic buildings with flaking lead-based paint um, and in asbestos insula insulation that's not in the best shape, um, who are then exposed to lead and asbestos contamination over a long period of time. Or, you know, they might live near multiple refineries and or manufacturing facilities uh, that have multiple environmental violations. So they would be impacted by multiple sources of exposure. Um, or, as is the case in a lot of our um, historic areas, they are exposed to both. They live in historic areas near manufacturing facilities with violations. So, you know, you can include that in this section as well as being those cumulative environmental impacts. Um, you also wanna think about the non-chemical stressors that impact your target area community, which might exasperate the impacts of chemical exposure and their effect on the community and the community's overall health. Um, so highlighting a few from this list, uh, you know, lack of food. Uh, if you have chronic uh, malnutrition in your area, you know, a lot of kids are on school uh, food programs or need additional assistance, stuff like that, um, noise from traffic or from facilities or airplanes, something like that, um, lack of access to health care, um, crime, repeat natural disasters. Uh, we got a lot of those in Louisiana. Kind of any of the factors that might stress out your community on an ongoing basis. All right. Just note, again, there's no one definition of a sensitive population. Um, so the sensitive population in your target area might not be on this list. Um, also kind of think about what makes your target area unique. And if there's a combination of factors that make your target area more in need of this funding than other areas. And again, as we keep mentioning, be sure to include data in this section to back up your community need and document your sensitive population. Um, so, for instance, you might want to show the high percentage of children under five in your target area, or the number of women of childbearing age, or what's the minority population. Um, you may also want to collect stats on crime rates or the lack of access to health care. Um, and we'll talk more about data as we cover each section, uh, but just keep that in mind throughout your proposal. Um, you want to be able to tell that story for that qualitative part of your proposal but make sure you also include the data to back that up. All right, Jen, would you like to talk about the impacts of the non-chemical stressors? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Rebecca just talked about these environmental impacts versus non-chemical stressors. And the impacts of non-chemical stressors on the health and welfare um, of not only the sensitive populations, but on the community as a whole can be um, really severe. But um, they're not things like, you know, since they're not things like cancer, they may get overlooked. But um, think back to a few of the things Rebecca just mentioned. Poverty, lack of food, excess noise, lack of health care, you know, repeat natural disasters. Um, Long-term exposure to those types of stressors can have a very serious impact on uh, mental, emotional, and social health of a community. Um, it can create or can increase rates of depression, substance abuse or addiction, um, you know, being under a constant state of stress can, um, can create added stress and dysfunction in a family, and it could possibly lead to increased incidences of um, domestic or child abuse. Um, so, you know, if you've ever studied psychology, um, I don't know if you remember this Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a thing, um, so that's what this pyramid is on the right. So without getting into the whole psychological thing, um, Maslow developed this, this psychological theory about human development that basically says 
um, if your most basic needs aren't met, you'll be unable to meet the other more advanced needs for the self. So the needs from the previous level must be fulfilled before advancing to the next level. So if you don't have shelter and safety, it's really hard to worry about other things higher up the pyramid. And you know this is devastating enough on the individual person. But then extrapolate this out to the entire community. Um, you know that, that's a that's a big deal. That that can have tremendous impacts on a community as a whole. So addressing the non-chemical stressors can help the sensitive populations and then the target area as a whole advance their needs and reach the top of their pyramid, which is you know, their full potential. Okay, so this information can be um, a little bit more challenging to find, but it can really pay off if you devote the time and effort to it. So check with uh, the local, regional, and state public health agencies for any figures about the items from the previous slide rates of depression or mental health issues, substance abuse and addiction information, figures about domestic abuse and child abuse. Um, public health schools can do large scale community surveys and studies on a number of topics. So check with any public health schools in your region to see if there's anything that can be of use to you. Um, you know, in, in Houston, the, the UT Public Health School was doing public health studies on parts of Houston all the time. So that was a, um, you know, I was fortunate in that respect. That was a huge resource for me. Um, and community police statistics, they can give you ideas about um, not only incidences of crime in your target area compared to other areas, but also the types of crimes that are being reported. Um, and, you know, these are just a few examples, but the important thing is to think outside the box on this. Um, take the time early on to gather the data and really dig in and see how this data can amplify your community story. And, you know, sometimes the data can tell a story you didn't even realize was there. So um, it's worth it to spend some time, just, you know, be creative, let your brain go, see what you can find, look at everything you've collected and um, use that data to, to, to tell your story, especially if it's something that, that's jumping out at you that is an issue you, you didn't even really realize was going on. Yeah, I really agree with that. I have started in one direction, you know, kind of writing the story of my community's need and then realized as I was gathering data or finding things in other plans and studies that um, it kind of needed to go in a different direction to kind of wrap it all together. Um, or not even, not even go in a different direction. I mean, I've had that happen too, but not even go in a different direction also just add to the story like yeah. you know, well well i thought my story was you know we're poor we're unemployed you know whatever but it also turns out you know we have um you know a rate of you know what diabetes that's 27 percent higher than the rest of the state or you know our crime statistics show you know these types of crimes are being committed more often here than other places or you know whatever like like you can find stuff out that will will only help your story it may change the direction but it may also just you know really go oh well you know what now we can add this component to the project too you know i agree thanks jen um, so the next steps kind of this is just kind of the introductory part just for defining your sensitive population. So the, the next steps include making a list of the sensitive populations in your target area or areas. Uh, you know who's going to be especially impacted by your brownfield sites and related issues like blight, exposure to contamination, lack of job opportunities, increased crime, etc. Um, and then as applicable ad related the statistics on those um, sensitive populations to your demographic table. Um, so you can back that up in your application. Ooh, there we go. Okay, so now that we've talked about who might be a sensitive population, let's go through uh, the three parts of the threats to sensitive population subsection, where you're gonna talk about how this funding will help those populations by addressing contamination at brownfield sites. 
Um, note that each of these sections is broken out in the request for application. So you want to keep the same numbering system so they can award you full points for each of those three parts. So notice it says um, 2A, II, and then 1. So you want to keep that same numbering system. Um, make sure it's clear which section, you know, th they should be looking at to award you points for that particular section. Um, so the first part is to talk about how this grant will improve health and welfare of the sensitive populations in your target area. So um, one note, if you talk about the health issues in this section, they might overlap with the health issues in uh, the next section in part two. Uh, that's okay, uh, but be sure to include information on whatever health effects you're talking about in both sections. So don't assume that um, the reviewer is going to, you know, refer back and forth. They're looking at what did you include in this specific section. Um, I think the main difference between this section, uh, this is more general uh, threats, and then the, the next one that we're going to go over is specifically related to contamination at your brownfield sites. Um, but like I said, sometimes they overlap, like with uh, lead-based paint or asbestos. Um, and if you need more clarification on what you should put where. Uh, that might be a good question for when uh, EPA does their grant chats once the RFA comes out to say, hey, where should I include this or what should be going here or there. All right, so let's go over what EPA is asking for in this section. Um, so they want to know specifically how this grant is going to address or facilitate the identification and reduction of threats to the health and welfare of sensitive populations in your target area or areas. Um, EPA underlines target area in the guidance, so make sure that you focus on your target areas in these sections. Um, you're gonna be ranked on the severity of the health and welfare issues experienced by the sensitive populations in your target areas and the extent to which this grant is going to help. Um, so notice the word severity. Um, so everyone applying for this funding is going to have a need for it. How does your need, how is it more severe than everyone else's? Um, this is why we told, tell you don't hold back in this section because you're being ranked based on whether your need is more severe than someone else's. Um, notice like we've said before, we've crossed out or and put and. Um, we recommend you make sure to get every point and include both if you're able to, but again, make sure you have the data and can fully flesh out both of those sections um, or just go with one or the other. So uh, for this section, you want to make sure you, one, describe your sensitive populations in your target area. You know, who are they? Uh, then two, what are their health and welfare issues? You know, how long have they been suffering with this? Why is their such situation desperate? And how is it more dire than what other people are experiencing? Again, you wanna make sure to include the data about your sensitive populations and their issues. And we're gonna give you some uh, ideas for this in the next few slides. And then finally, as we stated before, wrap it up with how this grant is gonna help. Um, remember, EPA wants to know how this funding is specifically going to address the needs in your community. I know we're mentioning this a lot, but like I said before, that seems to be a place where a lot of people lose points. So we just want to make sure that sticks in your brain. How is this funding going to help? Okay, so this is kind of a, a way you can kind of look at it to see some examples of um, health and welfare struggles and how this funding helps. Um, this is just kind of a simplified version to give you an idea of how to tie things together. Um, you can look through studies and community plans. Those are great resources to help you identify issues. Um, and they often provide data that you can then use to support your case. Um, if you find studies or plans that give more detail about sources of crime, health issues, et cetera, um, that you can tie in, please use them. You know, you can reference those in this section. That's great to use. They want to see that you're building off of other um, past studies and plans and bring all that in you know, pull it all together. Um, so let's talk, let's kind of go through these examples. So let's say your health or welfare issue in your area is crime. Um, so the, how that affects your sensitive population. 
Um, you have increased instances of, you know, robbery, assault, murder um, on the economically disadvantaged target area community. So you're noting that your sensitive population is the low income population. You know, data sources that you might look at, crime statistics, um, median income to show that it's a, a disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged community. Um, you know, you might want to note the number of blighted properties, which can then attract crime. You know, and how is this grant going to help? You know, well, you're going to redevelop blighted property. That's going to create more eyes on the street, add fewer hiding places for criminal activity. That's going to result in lower crime rates. Uh, and that's going to benefit your sensitive population by reducing the amount of crime they're exposed to. Um, you know, re redevelopment is going to create living wage jobs um, to provide for the people in the area, um, which also might reduce crime by providing more opportunity. Um, let's say your health or welfare issue is lack of access to health care. You know, you have um, the effect on your sensitive population. You have higher rates of, you know, whatever kind of disease in women of childbearing age, that's your sensitive population, and delayed fetal development. Um, you know, you know, kids are also part of that sensitive population. So data sources, you know, statistics on higher rates of whatever disease in the women of childbearing age. You also want to know, you know, what percentage of your people of, of women of childbearing age are in your area. Um, what are some of the numbers for the birth defects, miscarriages, preemie, low birth rates, you know, those kind of factors that are coming in. Um, talking about how this grant will help. Uh, you know, the proposed redevelopment of one of your priority sites is going to be a community health clinic. So that's going to help give these women access to health care, which is then going to uh, help them have more healthy births. Or you're also going to reduce their exposure to contamination in part one um, that can then, that causes issues with pregnancy and fetal development. Um, so like we mentioned in the, in the table that you're going to put together for part one that shows the um, the effects of the contamination at your sites. You know, that's where I said, you know, if you're going to note that it's going to affect fetal development there, this is how you can tie that together um, with the health and welfare of your community. Um, these are some other ones. I'm not going to go through them all, but I just wanted to make sure to include them in the presentation so you can kind of get some ideas. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about the last, the um, stress from limited safe housing options. We were talking about those stressors. Um, so let's say in your sensitive population area, you have lack of quality affordable housing options for low income seniors in your target area. And you also have blighted areas that attract crime, so it's making it unsafe. Um, so data sources, you know, your blighted property data, affordable housing statistics, you know, the number of people over 65 that live in poverty, um, your crime statistics, you know, that kind of thing to include in here. And then how this grant is going to help, um, you know, the proposed redevelopment includes safe, affordable senior housing and reducing of uh, blighted properties and redeveloping them. Um, that's also going to reduce crime. Um, so those are kind of some of the things, some of the ideas to get your mind going on how to tie it all together. All right, so the next steps, um, next steps for this section, you know, pick one or two health issues and maybe one or two welfare issues for each target area. Um, it's okay to have the same issues in multiple target areas, especially if they're adjacent, that's pretty common. Um, just make sure that you're clearly stating what they are in each target area and giving some stats for each one. Um, it's kind of good. You might even want to start off with three or four of each of them now and then see what plays out as far as the data goes. Kind of up to you and how much time you have. Um, then you want to research the data and the studies to back up those issues. And again, make sure you cover all your target areas um, and then define how this grant is going to help with those specific issues. Uh, all right. So that's part one. I just want to make sure that was kind of longer than I had expected. So why don't we take a quick pause. Are there any questions about that section? God, I didn't think I saw any come in. Just giving you a break to see if anybody else wants to put something into chat real quick. 
I didn't either. Um, I would like to just throw out the reminder that, you know, Rebecca's explained this all very well as far as the organization of it and the subsections and whatnot. Um, we are basing this off last year's guidelines that we expect the new ones to be similar this fall, but they could be minor changes. So, you know, keep that in mind as you're applying, you know, what you learned here to the next application. Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right, let's move on to number two, the greater than normal incidence of disease and adverse health conditions. Um, so this is telling your, the overall story of your community. You know, what are the disease and health issues that they're facing um, that really relate back to the contamination at your brownfield sites? All right, so let's go over the ranking and evaluation criteria for this subsection. Um, again, EPA is emphasizing how this grant uh, is going to address the identification and reduction of threats to people in your target areas um, who suffer from greater than normal incidences of diseases or conditions um, that may be associated with exposure to the contamination. Um, so just note, maybe, it doesn't have to be definite. You don't have to show direct correlation. You just have to show that there's something there that, you know, this is the contamination at your sites and the exposure can cause this and we're seeing elevated incidences of this in our area. Um, so Jen, do you wanna flesh this out a little bit more? Sure. So, um, you know, this is where you're going to talk about the actual disease and health issues in your target area and tie them back to the contamination in your target area. Um, and making the direct link back to your priority brownfield sites is really an ideal way to do that. Uh, since the guidelines specifically reference um, cancer, asthma, or birth defects, you need to talk about cancer, asthma, and or birth defects, um, but you can also talk about any other diseases or conditions that are occurring at a higher rate in your target area, as long as you can link it back to impacts from brownfields, you know, and again, especially from your priority sites. And this goes back to what we keep talking about, about look at the data, you know, dig in, don't, when you start looking at census information and public health studies and whatever, um, go into it with an open mind, um, you know, have an idea of what you're looking for, but don't, don't have tunnel vision, you know, allow yourself to, to think outside the box because you, again, you may find some things that are surprising. Okay, so um, it turns out you've got uh, elevated rates of cancer in your target area compared to state and national averages. And there's a history of industries that use tetrachloroethene as a solvent in the target area. So, you know, extra points if it's one of your priority sites. So in this section, you're gonna talk about that and how this grant will allow you to conduct phase one and phase two assessments and cleanup planning to help identify the actual risks and threats to your sensitive populations. Um, and then also to come up with a plan to address those threats. So maybe some of that cancer is mesothelioma related to asbestos exposure. Again, how will the grant help you identify that risk and reduce the exposure to asbestos? Maybe there are a high number of asthma cases in the target area. You know, is there a, a lot of vehicle traffic that passes through, through here? Are there documented air quality issues? Again, how will you use this grant to address these issues? Um, birth defects. It seems that there are a higher number of birth defects in your target area. Are there a lot of old gas stations in this area that may, um, may have been contaminated uh, or may have contaminated the soil and groundwater with leaded gasoline? You know, whatever the health issue, make sure you tie it back to how the grant will help you address it. And we keep harping on this, but um, that's a really good way to lose points. It, they specifically say, how will the grant help you do this? So you need to, I, I even suggest people use the sentence, this grant will help do this by this. You know, um, you really need to stress that point. Okay, also remember that the guidance in the past, and you know, again, this is the past, we don't know what it'll show this year, but the guidance in the past has allowed for up to 10% of grant funds to be used for health monitoring of populations that are exposed to hazardous substances from brownfield sites. So 
that's a great way to use this grant to help identify threats to sensitive populations in your target area, which is part of what you're supposed to be doing in this section. So obviously there are some caveats to this and only local governments have been allowed to use funding for this in the past. So um, make sure you read the guidelines very carefully and understand it if you think you may use funds in this way. But um, again, this could be an approach that very clearly shows the EPA, this is how this grant is going to help us, um, you know, monitor these risks and, you know, come up with an action plan. All right. So next steps for this section, um, you know, refer back to the health effects of the contamination you mentioned in part one. Uh, based on the current and past uses of your priority sites. So you put together that list of here's our priority sites, here are the current and past uses. You know, based on that, we expect to see these types of contamination and these are some of the health effects. You know, back at that again. Um, and then start looking at, you know, what are, looking at the data that relates to your target areas for those. So if you have, you know, something that was um, like asbestos, in your buildings and asbestos causes elevated risk of cancer. You wanna look and get the data for it for do you have elevated risk of cancer in your area and put that into this section. Um, so get statistics on the health effects in your target area. Um, or you might look at the health issues in your community. Uh, sometimes you go the other way and see what the health issues are and then see if brownfields might be the cause of that. Sometimes you go back the other way and say, all right, we're seeing elevated um, uh, risk of lead-based, you know, elevated li uh, levels of lead in children. You know, could, could our brownfield sites be a cause of that and, and do it that way as well? Um, and then again, define how this grant is going to address or facilitate um, the identification and reduction of those health issues. Um, so that all back around. All right, so number three for this section, the last part, um, we're going to talk about uh, disproportionately impacted populations. So let's go over what EPA is asking for in this section. Um, so again, you want to describe how this grant is going to address or facilitate identification and reduction of threats to uh, populations, again, in your target area, make sure you're focusing on that, that have environmental justice challenges uh, and or uh, proportionately share in the negative environmental consequences uh, for industrial, governmental, and or commercial operations. Uh, again, notice EPA is highlighting it's in the target area. Uh, and underneath the evaluation, note that you're going to be evaluated on um, the degree on your environmental justice challenges and environmental consequences. So again, what makes your community's challenges worse than everybody else's? Um, and again, don't forget to the extent to which this grant is going to help with those. So Jen, do you wanna give some examples of environmental justice challenges? Yeah, so um, here are some examples of environmental justice challenges that um, <laughs> they're mentioned in various uh, EPA, EJ documents that you could include in, include in your proposal. So um, I'm sure at least a few of these apply in your target area. Uh, remember that you don't have to include all of them. Um, think about which of these works with your overall narrative so that it's a very cohesive proposal. Uh, and there's a link to more information on EPA Environmental Justice 2020 National EJ Challenges in the next steps and helpful links document, as well as a link to the EPA EJ and Equitable Development webpage. So you might also wanna check out the EPA Environmental Justice 2020 Action Agenda for ideas. Yeah, both of those are um, really great resources. EPA has, um, uh, they've done extensive work on uh, environmental justice, and it's a very high priority for, um, for EPA brownfields in general. So you really want to make sure to incorporate that in, look at what their priorities were, and uh, bring that into the, to your proposal. 
All right. So something else you can add into the section uh, are the number of facilities, Superfund sites, toxic releases um, that are within or near your target areas. Um, so some places where you can find this data include EPA's uh, Mapper, which we're going to demonstrate in a minute. Um, that's an online tool that shows various sites that are in EPA's database, uh, including the EPA toxic release inventory, uh, Superfund sites, RICRA hazardous waste, um, brownfield sites. Uh, just kind of note that uh, for the brownfield sites, these are ones that EPA funding has actually been spent on. It's not a database of potential sites. Um, so just note that. Um, it also includes sites that are regulated underneath the Toxic Substances Control Act and sites with air pollution um, uh, violations. So it's a really good place to find data on what are some of the cumulative impacts in the area. Um, as we talked about in the last webinar, uh, EPA's EJ screen is another resource to find data related to cumulative impacts. Uh, and then one I've used before is EPA's Enforcement and Compliance History Online or ECHO database. Um, this has enforcement violations at different facilities. Um, I kind of use it as a broad brush. I don't get into the specific violations for each one, but I can show, you know, there were 20 violations within a one mile radius. So you can kind of use it that way. All right. Uh, as a reminder, you want to make sure to cite your sources in this section. Um, so don't use too much real estate for this. Um, you can just say, you know, based on EPA's EnviroMapper, we identified this many number of this kind of sites, that's enough. Um, if you have enough space, you might do a more formal citation, uh, but in general, just kind of noting where you got the information from, um, that's enough. Okay, now we're gonna make the attempt to switch over and, uh, give you an example of EnviroMapper. Okay, Scott and Jennifer, can you now see EnviroMapper up on your screen? Can I what? Can you see the yes. EnviroMapper? Okay. I can. Okay, so um, we're just gonna do a brief demo of this. I think it's a really great tool to find uh, a lot of basic statistics very easily. Um, so first, we're going to start in this uh, top part and type in an address like a city or a parish in the upper right-hand right corner. So I'm in Jefferson Parish. Uh, so we're just going to go with Jefferson, Louisiana. It might come up with the city, though. Okay. So we're going to come up with that. If you go on base map, which is right here, uh, you can see all the different base maps depending on what uh, what you want to see. If you want to see the aerial view, road view, we're just going to stick with the uh, basic view for right now. Under more data, you can go through. There are additional layers if you want places, water feature, tribal areas, non-attainment areas, um, you know, just kind of showing you what's there. Um, what I mostly look at is under search and viral facts. Um, so you can do by location, program, industry, um, chemical, or greenhouse gas. Uh, what I look at is mostly under programs. So if you click on programs, you go on this side, um, you can see the different options that are available. You know, air pollution, super fun sites, toxic releases, brownfields. So let's say uh, we want to see how many places had toxic releases. Um, and maybe hazardous waste sites. So as I click on them, note that they all um, start populating in here. Um, note some of them like super fun sites, that's great out, it says zero, that means obviously there are none within the area. So if you see where the closest super fun site is, you might need to uh, scroll out. Um, but notice also if you scroll out too far and the numbers get to be too much, um, those start are getting grayed out too, just like hazardous waste. Now there's too many for to map. Um, so you just want to make sure to zoom in and out depending on uh, what information that you need. Um, if you note know, here, there's a little, just a little box with an arrow. That's just one site. Um, so you can uh, count that as one. 
And obviously, if there's multiple sites, um, I'm sure what's going on here that there's 57, um, but there's 57 sites here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll say if my site is here, you know, how many facilities are within that area? Let's say, let's take off this hazardous waste site. So let's say our site is here, you know, how close are, are all these hazardous waste sites? One easy way to find out how many are within a specific um, distance, you want to click on tools and then go into view imagery. Oh, not view imagery, sorry. My notes are a little off. Okay, measure. Um, so you can measure um, an area. So you can make it so it goes, you can draw your box and then say within and then double click to end. I'll give you, you know, it's almost 3,000 acres, or you can also change it into square miles. You know, within a 4.6 square mile radius, we have this many number of sites, and I just literally add them up. Um, you can also do a uh, distance. Let's say your site is in the middle of uh, this subdivision. You know, the closest ones are, you know, 0 0.41 miles away. So you can do that as well, just to show how close or far away things are. Um, note that, again, you can change your um, uh, units of measurement, miles, kilometers, feet. Um, also, just FYI, this is just kind of a helpful tool. I don't think you actually include in your application, but in case for something else, you can also get the uh, latitude and long longitude. So just kind of a helpful little land yap tip. Um, okay, so before we switch back to the presentation, are there any questions on EnviroMapper itself? Again, really useful tool. Um, kind of go out just to show what you're trying to demonstrate is you know, our, our community is exposed to, you know, 22 plus 28 plus 54 sites all within the small area. And that's why they are exposed to more of these cumulative impacts. Okay, um, so just a couple notes on this. Don't get too stressed out about exact numbers. Uh, the idea is to just demonstrate that you have multiple sources of contamination. Um, so if you draw a polygon and there's 27 sites or 30 sites, if you go a little farther, that's not, that's not that big of a deal. What you're really trying to emphasize is people are still being impacted by multiple sources. So don't, don't get caught up on having everything be exact. And then uh, you don't need to check all these databases. Um, let's go down. So you don't need to check all the databases or include all the data you find or go down the data rabbit hole. Uh, so just as a reminder, it, it can be very easy to um, start collecting masses amounts of information and try to include it all in. But remember, make sure to focus the data and the information on what supports your overall story. Um, to be honest, I normally end up with kind of a mass of information that I cram in and then trying to get it down to whatever the page limit in, a lot of the stuff starts, starts going by the wayside. Um, but so kind of think about that as you're collecting data, what's gonna go in and tell your overall story. Um, so Jen, now that we've covered some examples of operations, uh oh, nope, okay. All right, so one more resource that I wanted to add in here um, Louisiana Department of Health. Hey, Rebecca, you still have EnviroMapper up. Oh, sorry. I, I switched down my slide. Y'all didn't come. <laughs> All right, let's go back over. Okay. You got the treasure trove now? Yes. Okay. All right, Louisiana Department of Health, treasure trove of data. Love this site. Um, it takes a little time to go through all the options, uh, but it's an easy way to find some of the key stats and compare them to other parishes within the state. Um, 
I got this, what I have on the screen, we're not gonna go through it all. I'm just putting it up there so you can see what's there. This is only the first two levels of data. It then drills down even farther. So you can kind of see underneath, get back here. Um, so even underneath, under county health rankings, social economic factors, you can drill down even farther to health factors and they even have information on violent crime in here. Um, so all of these have subheadings underneath. Um, EPA really likes that you're using state and local health agencies and partnering with them. So this is a great source uh, just to reference in general, um, but it is very helpful to find a lot of great information quickly and compare it to uh, the parishes. Um, if we have time at the end, we're gonna do a demo of the site um, but we just want to make sure to get through everything else first. You can kind of see here, uh, this little map, when you bring up the data, you can bring it up to compare to other parishes. So you can, that can help demonstrate your need. Um, and we also have a great map um, that can help you, help you see, you know, how desperate the situation is in your particular parish in order to compare that to other areas. Um, so really great um, source of information for Louisiana. Yeah, and then if I could, Rebecca, um, once you have collected that information that she just went over at the more, you know, local regional level, um, then it's a real simple sort of Google search to just find it um, at the national level. You know, if you have mm -hmm. county and state information all right there in one website, then you can go, oh, okay, well, what's the national rate of, you know, pick a thing, what exposure to heavy metals? Um, you know, then, then, then it narrows down, um, you know, you know exactly what, what, what it is that you're searching for at a national yep. level. It's not this just like, oh my, this scavenger hunt of, oh my gosh, what am I trying to find? So. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so Jen, uh, now that we've covered some examples of uh, the operations that might affect our target communities, um, you want to go over some examples of policies that could affect people in the target areas? Yeah, so, um, you know, the final piece of this section about disproportionately impacted populations wants you to address how this grant will help you identify and or reduce the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and or commercial operations or policies that the target areas uh, disproportionately share. Okay, what, is this, what does this actually mean? Um, and what are some examples of this? So any disruption of community interconnectedness that's done by an industry, um, a governmental or a commercial policy, like uh, a highway being constructed that cut through a community, you know, this can lead to a loss of homes and businesses. You know, this can also affect air quality by allowing a lot more traffic to move through the community than was previously there. Um, railroad, railroad placement bisecting communities. So um, I, railroads are just, you know, I hope there's no railroad people on the call, but they, they're, they, they, they can create a whole host of their own issues. So if you've got railroads in your target area, look at them, evaluate them. They, chances are they can fit into your picture somehow. So um, I worked with a community in Houston that wanted to have a bridge put over active railroad tracks because of the disruption those tracks had on the daily lives of residents. So an example of this dis disruption is that the train often went through in the morning and would stop for loading and unloading. And, you know, we've all been stopped at those trains before where they are stopped on the tracks and you do not know when they're going to start moving again, right? So this meant that for however long that took, one side of the community was completely cut off from the other side of the community. And what was happening was that parents who were trying to take their kids to school before going to work would often just turn around and take the kids home, causing the kids to miss school um, because the parents couldn't risk being late to work and losing wages or possibly getting fired because this is, you know, an area with, you know, high unemployment, high underemployment. Um, so, you know, they, they, they had to get to work. Um, so the disconnection that this rail line is causing is contributing to 
kids missing out on their education in an area that is already really struggling with dropout rates, unemployment rates, you know, you name it. Um, plus, again, there are, you know, kind of a lot of environmental issues that can accompany the rail industry. Um, a lack of zoning or old zoning. This was a big deal in Houston because um, Houston doesn't actually have zoning. Um, so we would have old industry with residential areas just speckled throughout it. So you would have a, you know, a processing plant that used all sorts of chemicals from 1950 until even maybe now, um, and then it's right in the center of a residential area. So this created all kinds of environmental justice issues. Um, in a community that I'm working with right now, uh, there's an, and this is not in Texas, um, there's an abandoned, or Louisiana for that matter, not in EPA Region 6, how about that? Um, there's an abandoned plant, uh, and when that company closed up their operations and moved them out of town, they went through and did all sorts of things like pouring concrete down all the floor drains, cutting all the wiring, basically destroying the interior of the building. And from what I was told, um, this was that company's basic process for when they were moving out of a building. This was just their policy. This is what they did. Um, but what it did was leave behind a shell of a building on a huge parcel of land that a potential investor has to either spend millions of dollars rehabbing the building to make it even operational as a warehouse, um, you know, which it, it, you know, it could have been, um, it would have been just fine to operate as a warehouse had the previous owner not done all this damage to it. Um, or, you know, a possible investor would have to come in and spend millions of dollars demoing the building to create a fresh starting point. So, you know, needless to say, this property has been sitting vacant in this community for about a decade because of this policy. So um, these are just a few examples, but think about how operations and policies are negatively impacting those in your target area. And you know what, if you aren't really sure, talk to the people in your target area. Chances are good, they are very clear on what's going on. Yeah, definitely. I found working with the community groups, if you would talk to one or two of the folks that work there on a regular basis, they can probably give you a laundry list of mm -hmm. Um, some of the policies and operations going on that really negatively impact that population and, um, you know, prevent education uh, achievements or limit job opportunities or uh, have all sorts of, of negative impacts on the, on the population. Right. Like the example I gave about the railroad tracks and the, you know, parents turning around to take their kids home um, instead of taking them to school, you know, from my office, I never would have known that. That is not a thing that would ever have become apparent to me as an issue. It was only from talking to the people in the community that we learned what a significant issue that is. Yeah. Um, so the final tip on that one was don't forget to talk about your target area. The focus of this should be on your target area. Yeah, the generalities are good, but make sure you always tie it back uh, to your target area and your uh, priority sites too. All right. We keep kind of, um, we're talking about the target area a whole lot. We, we, and we haven't, I don't feel like, at least I haven't really stressed that of tying your priority sites back into this, but let me stress that now. Tie your priority sites back into <laughs> this, right? So, you know, how will the redevelopment of your priority sites help all of these issues that you're talking about here. Yeah, and we're, and we're mentioning that just because that's something that we've seen uh, in grant proposals that people, you kind of start getting into the data and start pulling it in and you kind of, it's easy to get lost in, in the data um, and people forget, especially when you're writing your proposal, you get into it so much, you have been taught, you feel like you've talked about your target area a lot but you forget that you didn't include it in this specific section. Um, and EPA is grading you individually on each, um, each section. Um, and one of, one of the examples I'll give of that is one of the proposals that I wrote early on, I think I mentioned this before, it was, for, it was in the city of New Orleans. So I clearly stated that it was a minority you know, 
predominantly minority population in the target area. I've stated that in the first part of it. Um, I didn't state it in each and every section along the way. And I had a viewer that took points off in every section that I didn't specifically mention uh, how it was affecting the minority community, um, you know, whatever that category was. So um, make sure in each one you're really focusing on your target area, you know, the populations and what's going on with your priority sites in each and every section. And just, you know, a little plug, um, this is another really great reason to have KSU tab or someone else um, experienced grant reviewer review your proposal for you. Um, because, um, you know, at tab, we, if you allow, allow enough time, we'll review your proposal and um, we, you know, or me, I guess I can't speak for all the reviewers, but you know, we um, kind of, I don't want to say tear them up, but, but we get really critical and look at, <laughs> and look, well, and we're looking for things like that. You know, what are the things that are, that are being missed that are obviously going to cause a deduction in points? Yeah, and we do sound like we're advertising them, but I, that, that was one of the biggest helps to me was sending it into KSU and having um, an objective look at it and help me see things that maybe after I've been writing it, you know, for three weeks straight um, that I would miss. Same. And, you know, because I'm, yes, I, I am a KSU tab employee now, but I was a Brownfield program manager. That was how I, you know, became acquainted with them. And so I can speak to that too, that they, um, I may not have gotten grants funded if it weren't for a part of that review process. Yeah. All right, so next steps for this section. Um, define, uh, you know, one to three environmental justice issues that are in your target area. Um, research, you know, industrial, governmental, and or, you know, commercial environmental operations um, that impact your target area. Explore EnviroMapper, see if that helps. Um, explore, you know, some of the policies that might impact your target area. Um, and then define how this grant grant is going to help with those specific environmental justice issues or impacts. And again, like Jen said, you know, use that sentence. This grant will help address these issues by dot, dot, dot. Um, one note, just so FYI, um, proposals that are posted on the KSU website from the 2018 competition, you know, we tell you from time to time to look back at those to get some ideas. Uh, this section was called economically impoverished slash disproportionately impacted population. Um, it didn't really correlate to what they're asking you for now. Um, so just kind of make sure if you're looking at those examples, um, those don't necessarily uh, match up to what EPA is currently asking for. Um, and just, you know, as a reminder, uh, make sure you check the RFA when it comes out in August. Um, and see what they're specifically asking for in each of these sections to make sure uh, that lines up. All right, so Jen, you want to go over the summary? Yeah, so just a quick recap of this section. Um, you know, make sure you are defining your sensitive populations. Um, talk about the health and the welfare of your sensitive populations. Um, you know, it's really easy to talk about the big scary health stuff, but the, 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 the more subtle, more subtler effects that we were discussing, you know, being at long-term exposure to noise or crime or, you know, whatever, um, don't, don't sell that part short. And that has a tremendous impact on the community. Um, discuss the greater than normal incidences of disease and adverse health, health conditions in your target area. Um, and especially compared to the community in the city and the larger areas. Um, how is the community in your target area disproportionately impacted by environmental justice and uh, industrial, governmental, and commercial operations and policies? And don't forget to state <laughs> in each section how this funding is gonna help mitigate those threats. So this should also relate back to your priority sites and your community's need for funding. All right, so let's review the next steps. Um, again, make a list of your sensitive populations in your target area. Um, pick one or two health issues and one or two welfare issues for each target community. Um, okay to have the same issues if, you, if they're close by. Um, 
research data and studies to back up those issues. And then again, to find how that grant's gonna help. And then in the number two, refer back to your health effects of your, the contamination that you mentioned in part one um, and based on the current and past use of your priority sites. You want statistics on those specific health effects in your target area um, or go the opposite way and look at the health issues in your community and see if brownfields might be a cause for that. Um, and then define how this grant is gonna help address those issues. And then uh, define one or three environmental justice issues in your target area. Uh, research the operations and the policies uh, that might be impacting them. And then again, define how this grant is going to help uh, with specific issues. Um, something else to keep in mind, each part of the subsection, they're all worth uh, five points. Um, so while they're important, uh, you don't necessarily need them to be super lengthy, like five, six paragraphs one or two paragraphs for each part of the subsection um, should work. Okay, so any questions about accessing the data? Um, any questions on that? Got anything from the audience? I don't see anything else coming through. Nope. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna keep going then because we still have some other stuff to cover. We're, we might go a little long. I'm sorry for that. If you do need to hop off, remember we are recording these. Um, so you can always come back later, fast forward, and catch the tail end. Uh, and if you do have questions after the webinar, after watching it later, you know, feel free to get in contact with us. Um, but I'm just, I'm just going to keep going. All right. So the next section is community engagement. Um, we're going to go over project partners, who to involve in your project, how to describe their role in your brownfield program, and how to outline your plan for effective and community engagement and input. Um, this section has three subsections. Uh, so we're gonna discuss the first two project partners and project partner roles together, uh, including who needs to be on board to make sure this grant is a success and facilitate the redevelopment of sites and the revitalization of the neighborhood. And then what specifically is their role in your Brownfields program? So uh, make sure your partner list includes local pro uh, partners in your target area and that their role is clearly defined. Um, so EPA recommends using this table format for this section, um, which addresses both uh, your community partners and their role. And here's a big tip. If EPA provides an example table, use the table. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for the reviewer to find the information. They're reviewing somewhere between 12 to 18 proposals, so the easier you can make it for them to find the information, um, the easier it is for them to give you the points that you deserve. Um, so we really recommend that you use this table that has the partner and their specific role in your project. So here's the ranking and evaluation criteria for the project partner section. Um, who are the local partners that are going to be involved in the project? Um, so you want to show you're connected to the local community and have the partners needed to make this Brownfield program successful. Um, so this can include community organizations like neighborhood groups, citizen groups, business organizations, that type of thing. Um, the et cetera in that line, you know, it can include downtown revitalization groups, economic development districts or foundations local nonprofit partners, um, for instance, ones that are involved in community development, equitable development, or addressing the needs that you talked about earlier. You know, any nonprofit organizations that work in your target area would be great. Other project partners include organizations uh, in the development community that are gonna be part of the redevelopment or the reuse of the site, uh, like property owners, uh, lenders, that can include banks, community development funds, you know, whoever runs your CDBG program, anyone that might provide funding for the project, um, developers or your development organizations, you know, public, private, nonprofit. Honestly, you're going to have to partner with them for a successful redevelopment project, so it's good to include them here. You might look for uh, mission-driven developers in your area. Um, mission-driven ones are ones that are looking to do more than just make a profit. Um, they normally incorporate in affordable housing, 
sustainable development, you know, some of those other overall community goals into their projects. Those are great ones to partner with. Uh, if you're a regional organization, uh, i.e. not the local municipality, uh, you want to make sure to note the local town, city, parish, wherever your target areas are, whatever that local municipality is as a partner. Um, for the contact person, <coughs> you want to include maybe someone in uh, like one of these, like someone in community development or economic development or planning or neighborhood engagement. They would all make a good contact. If you include an elected official, uh, like a mayor or city council person or someone who's non-civil service, you just want to make sure that they're going to be around all the way through next like February, March, because EPA does have the option of contacting partners to make sure they're really on board and they do do that. So you just want to make sure that whoever you put on that list um, is going to be around in the next few months when EPA does their review. So someone will pick up the phone and know what they're talking, you know, if they say, do you know about this Brownfield project, they can say, yes, we're excited about it. Um, other groups, organization or partners um, that might help you reach the general public would be good, like local radio stations, newspaper that agrees to run your stories. You know, how are you going to connect with the, with the local general population? Um, I'd also add in the Louisiana Brownfield Association. Uh, they can help with distributing information about your program. Um, you are also more than welcome to include LDEQ as a project partner. Um, we can help you facilitate projects, provide oversight of your investigations or help with that, um, and assist with outreach. Um, notice that you're going to be evaluated on the degree to which the project partners represent different types of groups and organizations. Um, so make sure you include a variety. Um, keep in mind quality over quantity. Um, so you want to make sure to cover all your bases, uh, but you only have so much space. So I've been known to chop some people off, you know, just to make sure we show the breadth. It doesn't mean they won't be involved once we actually implement the grant. It just means for the purposes of the proposal, you want to show that you have a, a large selection or a, a good selection of project partners. Um, again, I recommend including at least one community group, neighborhood organization in each target area um, to help reach out to the affected community and present opportunities for um, you know, residents, business owners, members of the community to provide input into the decision-making process, both for site selection and for the reviews. So notice in the evaluation criteria, you will, you'll need to identify and describe your local partners. Um, so basically, if it's not obvious from the name of the entity what that entity is, uh, just go ahead and add a note on who they are, either underneath the partner name column or in the project partner roles column. So for instance, a reviewer from out of town is not going to know that Shreveport Common is a local nonprofit or something called Blue Bayou Force for Change is the neighborhood association, um, or even that Bill Platt is a city. Um, so you might want to just add that in parentheses after the name of the entity. Just give them a little context of who they are if it's not really obvious from the name. And Jen, do you want to talk about uh, project partners and project needs? Yes, I do. Um, so, how do you decide which partners you're going to work with? You know, um, chances are good you've got this pretty extensive network of, of potential partners out there, um, or, you know, you're looking for other partners. How do you make the decision of who to actually work with? So ultimately, um, some of your very best community partners are going to be those that are not only invested in the community, but um, are also those that will help advance your project. So think about what the goals of your project are, what the community priorities are, and then identify partners that can help you accomplish those things. So my target area for um, the last grant that I wrote was trying to attract employers. I've got these all up here on the screen. They were trying to attract employers, provide access to affordable housing, create community connectivity, get in increased access to fresh, healthy food, decrease crime and blight, and preserve the negative or uh, the neighborhood character. So um, these 
are the local partnerships that we pulled in for this specific project. So, um, you know, for attracting employers, we worked with the Community Revitalization Corporation. And, and, and if you look at this list, you'll see that that, that CRC is noted um, at every point. This was um, like our prime partner in this project. Um, there was a very active CRC. Um, they were very involved in the community. They knew everyone. Um, and, and a lot of the planning efforts that had been uh, going on over the years about what did the community need, you know, that sort of thing had been done by the CRC. So um, they were involved every step of the way. Um, okay, so we also work with uh, the local management district, you know, maybe the, the city economic development program, looking at access to affordable housing. Again, the CRC and the city housing department, um, decreasing crime and blight. There's a city of Houston has a the police department has a, an environmental division. Um, they were very, very helpful with, with that component for us. Um, creating community connectivity. We worked with a series of nonprofits for this part, the Houston Parks Board, the Buffalo Bayou Partnership. We also worked with um, the city parks department, the planning department, and the public works department because this was going to um, you know what? What that? What we were trying to do was in not only increase park space, but increase access to, to park space, um, increase recreation trails, pedestrian-friendly streets, and street patterns. So um, for those types of projects, you know, we needed a lot of people involved. Um, providing access to healthy foods. There was a local Montessori school that was um, developing an urban garden. Uh, in the community, and so that was going to become, um, you know, a potential source of fresh produce for the people in the community. Also, the CRC was working, um, targeting developers for one of our priority brownfield sites um, for a grocery food chain, a grocery store chain, uh, because there wasn't a, a grocery store in this neighborhood, you know, at all, any, you know, very far away. From a grocery store. So, um, and again, I, I, I touched on that several times throughout my application that the pri this priority brownfield site is being targeted for this type of redevelopment. Um, and then preserving the neighborhood character, again, that was the CRC. So, um, let's see here. You want to move on, Rebecca? There we go. Okay. So, um, we're going to try to have a little interactive component here. We'll see how this goes. Um, so I want you to pretend that your community has the same goals as those that I've just gone through, those that are up here on the screen right now. Um, who would you target in Louisiana, um, you know, at the local, regional, state level? Um, you know, and we're going to go through these, um, and using your chat box, just tell us who you would partner with in your area, again, local, regional, or state level, to help you accomplish these goals. So, um, attracting employers, just start brainstorming. Who do you think, who do you think you would, you would reach out to in your community if you were trying to attract new employers? Oh, GNO Inc. That's a good one. Uh, Greater New Orleans Inc. They cover um, a good chunk of uh, Southeast Louisiana. Uh, a lot of, uh, they have a lot of great resources in that too. Oh, New Orleans Business Alliance. Uh, they're another good one. We partner with them on some, um, some outreach activities. Uh, they're also really connected with the Urban Land Institute to help um, connect you with uh, developers as well and with uh, funders. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, North Rapids Business and Industry Alliance. Those are good ones, Kim. Uh, yeah, I'm finding a lot of throughout Louisiana, they, uh, we have a lot of those business and industry alliance groups. Uh, this one in Jefferson Parish for the West Bank and, um, and some in the other areas as well. They're really good to, uh, to connect with. Yeah, and the larger oh, yeah. employers too. Yeah. Yep, yep, really that's good. Um, actually, that's what I found in going to other places. Um, 
they they really involve their larger employers and their foundations in brownfield redevelopment because they really want to attract uh, people to their area. And uh, in order to attract workers for whatever operations they have, it helps, you know, they, who wants to move to a place that has a lot of blighted property? Um, so a lot of those large employers also have an interest in redeveloping brownfield sites. Yeah, yep. Um, what about providing access to affordable housing? Would large community colleges be a good contact? You know, um, I think having partnerships with community colleges, large or small, local universities, any type of educational facility, man, those are some good partners to have. So yes, I think that would be good. <laughs> yeah, including those as well. Um, and you know, for um, creating community connectivity, um, I, one of the things I didn't realize, AARP is actually a really um, a good proponent of that because they are interested in helping seniors um, be able to navigate the community and a lot of times that involves uh, really good uh, pedestrian access you know make sure it's ADA accessible all of that so those are yeah, that's, that's a really good point I never would have thought of that yeah um, and neighborhood character you know Louisiana trust for historic preservation um, and neighborhood preservation groups like preservation resource center um, those can be really good as well uh, any ideas for decreasing crime and blight that y'all have connected with that might be um, helpful community partners for that? Oh, NORA. Yeah, New Orleans Redevelopment Authority. Um, they're, they've, uh, they're a really good resource. They also have a lot of sites. So they're good ones to partner with on, on some potential sites as well for developing affordable housing. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to admit, uh, being at a government agency, um, I didn't always really have a great network of community contacts, uh, but what I did was I worked with my project partners um, to help brainstorm ideas and see if they were already working with, especially the developers, um, really helped connect me and figure out who's, who's working with whom, um, and becoming a part of some of these local organizations, you know, like Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation, then connected me with the local Main Street program. You know, also Louisiana Economic Development is a good resource. Um, so you can kind of grow your network that way. And now is a really good time to start that. Yeah, and and um, I completely agree with that. And I, you know, would like would like to stress that point of um, you know the using your partners to connect to other partners. I um, I would say. I don't know, 75% might, might seem a little high, but um, the, the majority of the partners that I worked, up, worked with on um, one of my last projects in Houston came from other project partners. I mean, because it would just be, you know, people that have been involved in the community for a long time, and they'd say, oh, you know, you know who else you need to talk to? So-and-so. Let me introduce you to so-and-so. And, -so. and um, you know, getting out there and talking to the people will really help connect you to the other people that can that can um, help you further whatever work it is that you're trying to do. Yeah. And if you are in, um, you know, a, a, a well, I'm saying I'm targeting out a government institution. You know, this might happen at at non-governmental institutions too. But you know, we tend to get really boxed in and really siloed in our own little department in our own little area branch out in your organization because um, chances are really, really good that there's other people in your organization, especially local government, that are, you know, fighting the same fight that you are and would be happy to partner mm -hmm. with you on things. All right, so now that you've gotten, you know, have your list of project partners, um, you want to talk about the project partner roles. Um, so here's the ranking and evaluation criteria for the roles subsection. Um, note that the rules should involve making decisions related to site selection, cleanup, and future reuse of the priority sites. Um, and if you're applying for a site-specific grant, um, also want to talk about your plan to involve the community groups um, directly affected by that site. Um, so really important if you're doing a site-specific grant to say how they've been involved with the reuse planning for that specific site. Uh, if you're applying for an assessment coalition grant, uh, 
want to talk about each coalition member, uh, make sure they're all listed in this section, uh, and how their communities are going to be engaged and informed throughout the entire process. Um, and notice that the evaluation criteria for this uh, denotes meaningful involvement. So for a while, community involvement meant really just telling the community what you're going to do, and they didn't really have a chance to provide any feedback on that. So EPA really wants you to go beyond that now and actively solicit their feedback into the projects, make sure you're considering that feedback and involving it in the process. So you want to be very specific on what uh, partner's role is going to be in this, um, specifically how they're going to be able to affect the outcomes of this process. Okay. So again, you want to clearly state the partner's role in redevelopment. Um, remember, EPA is looking for partners that are involved in making decisions related to site selection, cleanup, and future reuse of the priority brownfield sites. Uh, these are some examples as to what to include in the roles. Uh, you don't have to do much, like you don't need to use a lot of real estate for this. You just really want to be clear and you want to be concise. So make sure you're noting who's involved in your site selection process, providing input into site reuse. Uh, and this is another uh, place where you might want to look through other proposals uh, to see what they included, how they worded it. I found that was really helpful for kind of wordsmithing this section uh, to make sure that it was clear and concise. Um, again, if you're applying for a site-specific grant, you want to make sure to include how the community groups or representatives are involved, especially with the reuse planning. Um, and then coalitions, make sure you're going to note how they're going to be involved throughout the entire uh, project. Um, so you might think about having an advisory committee or a roundtable or just noting that you're going to have monthly, quarterly, quarterly you know, semi-weekly, whatever works for you, coordination meetings to make sure you're really coordinating throughout the entire process. So here's kind of an example table of how to put this together. Um, tip for this section, if you need more room, you can kind of group organizations that have similar roles in the table and kind of put them all together. Um, so you can see in the top, um, we've got kind of our cities, municipalities here at the top. You know, clearly stating they're the local government contacts, what they're going to do. They're part of this BCART membership, which is the roundtable part um, throughout the entire grant period, um, and specifically saying they're going to provide reuse input um, and ensure it aligns with local plans. You know, here's all of our local contacts. Our, you know, this one is not really obvious, so make sure to put in parentheses that it's a nonprofit. Um, including everybody's name, their title, phone number, email. Uh, make sure to double check those uh, to make sure they're up to date. Um, and then make sure to include, you know, who are these? These are our community partners. They're going to help us identify sites, participate in site selection, you know, provide input to the reuse. Uh, and then also including Louisiana Brownfield Association uh, into this as well. So just clear, concise, make sure you're covering all your bases. All right, Jen, you want to do the summary for this? Yeah, so real quick summary. Um, we can keep things rolling along. Um, think about your community partners. Um, who is already involved? And then who else do you need to um, pull in? Do you need to get involved to make your Brownfield program a success? Um, and identify the specific contact people that you're going to be working with and um, really clearly define their role in your Brownfield program and with your priority sites. All right, so your next steps, kind of reiterating what uh, Jen said in the summary, so I'm not going to repeat each one, uh, but make sure you want to contact each, each person that you're going to list in your document. You want to explain that you're applying for a Brownfield grant um, discuss how they might be involved and make sure they're okay with that plan. Uh, if they're willing to participate, you want to confirm their contact information. And then, like I mentioned before, double check that they're still going to be with the organization through next February, March, just in case EPA actually contacts them. Uh, and give them a heads up that EPA is contacting them, and it might be a few months out, 
um, just to make sure that they're on board, but just make sure that they're aware of that so they don't get surprised. Um, I like to call people and then I follow up with an email, um, but if you work with them pretty regularly, email works just fine too, just to make sure you update that contact information. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I always get excited when I get to talk to these people because these are the ones that get excited about brownfields like I do. Uh, so this is something I tackle early so I can, one, get it done. Uh, two, it gives me excuse to check with people uh, that are normally as excited about the redevelopment as I am. Uh, and three, it's, it's a good one when you kind of need a mental block on the other section. You know, as we mentioned, the um, threats to the sensitive populations part, it can get a little depressing. So sometimes it's nice to contact community partners in between just to get that excitement um, and, and remember why you're putting all this together um, to really see that light at the end of the tunnel. So just kind of a little mental health tip for that section. Okay, so a little break for the chat. So let's see, um, partners can be private entities. Yes, they absolutely can be private entities. Um, commercial banks, uh, one thing we to mention, um, commercial banks have, there's a mandate underneath the oh, CRA, which I think is the Community Revitalization Act. Yes, it is. Where large banks are actually required uh, to provide investment in um, economically disadvantaged areas. Um, so if you are going to contact one of your big banks, I would ask for, your, for their CA, CRA officer uh, and talk to them and see if they would be willing to be the contact for this. They are wonderful resources for this. Um, commercial Realtors, also a really good organization. There's the um, each area, and you, contact me if you need to know who it is because I made a list of them, has kind of an association of realtors. Um, so you can connect with them and connect with commercial realtors as well. Um, people ask me for a list of potential brownfield sites and we don't maintain that because that is way too much work to keep up to date on a regular basis. Um, so we, we suggest that they connect with a local realtor uh, to find a site that works with you know, their redevelopment plan and then come to us for brownfield funding if they need it. Um, so commercial realtors are also a really good um, organization to partner with as well. All right, any other questions? Okay, and we're just going to keep going. All right, in this subsection uh, in community engagement, incorporating community input, um, you're going to want to talk about how you plan to involve the community in your brownfield program and the reuse of your priority sites. Uh, including the efforts of your partners and your coalition members. So we're going to give you some ideas on how to creatively and effectively engage the community so you're not just informing them of your activities, but actually engaging them in the process. So in this subsection, like the others, only worth five points, but it's a really important five points. Um, so you want to make sure you're clear about hitting all these points. Um, I love you know, brownfield projects, redeveloping vacant and abandoned buildings and sites. Uh, but let's be honest, there's also a risk that these projects are going to negatively impa impact the surrounding community or not align with the needs and the plans of the actual local residences. Um, we've all seen that before where someone comes in and puts in a new redevelopment and it really just doesn't jive uh, with what the, the local community really wanted or needed. Um, EPA also very well aware that this has happened in the past, um, so they really emphasize that you need to not just inform your target area community, but you really need to actively engage them in the process. So in this section, you want to discuss your plan to communicate project progress to the local community in the target area, um, initial site selection, through assessment and cleanup, and then all the way through redevelopment and reuse. Um, notice that the criteria specifically ask for frequency and methods of communication. Um, these are not set in stone, so don't feel like if you committed to something here, you absolutely have to do it later on. Things might change, um, but you should be realistic about this, about what kind of outreach you're going to do. Um, and Jen's going to provide some examples for us later on. 
Um, note that the evaluation criteria also says the community's input should be solicited, considered, and responded to in a meaningful way. So make sure your plan includes and specifically states how you're going to actively engage the community, not just telling them what you're going to do, but you know, solicit their comments, consider them, and respond to them. Um, if you're already involving the community, you know, make sure to note that. Um, and then note how your planned efforts are going to dovetail or build on those efforts. Um, you don't want to just say what you've done in the past. You want to make sure to say this is what we're going to do moving forward. Um, if you haven't engaged the community yet, that's okay. Now's a great time to start. Um, you can even ask them on feedback for the best methods to reach community members. Uh, and then in your proposal, you can note that you ask them how to reach them and this is what they said, so this is what you plan on doing. All right, so John, do you wanna um, talk about soliciting community input? Yeah, so, um, you know, discuss your plan to communicate project progress uh, to the local community, um, project partners, and the residents or groups that are um, either in or in close proximity to the target area, um, including the frequency and by what method you will use and how input will be solicited, considered, and responded to. All right, that's all the stuff Rebecca just went over, right? So community engagement and community involvement is absolutely essential for Brownfields projects, um, both from a funding standpoint and from an implementation standpoint. Um, the EPA is not going to fund a project if they don't think the community is being significantly involved in this process. So um, KSU TAB did an entire webinar on community engagement last July. So take a look at that if you want more ideas and information about effective community engagement in your community. Um, you can find it on our website and I've included the link on, oh, I thought I included the link on the slide. Well, we'll get the link out to you guys somehow, okay. but it's on our website if you just search um, under our webinars. Um, so we covered a lot of ground in that webinar, but I want to highlight a few points here that you should keep in mind both as you're writing, um, writing your grant and as your work advances. So um, what community engagement method or methods will be the best fit with your goals and the goals of your community? So that may be very different depending on the, the community that you're in, um, you know, one neighborhood versus another or one goal versus another. So, so um, think, about, think about those things to determine how you should best engage with the community at that point for that purpose. Um, what kinds of questions should you ask? So thinking about the past, present, and future, um, you know, those are, those are some, you know, great types of questions to ask. I've got a few examples up there on the screen. Um, you know, what recent changes are you excited about? What recent changes concern you? Um, what are the best reasons to live, work, and do business here right now? Um, and, you know, what are, some, what are some of your big ideas for the future of your target area? Learn about the people's narratives for the target area and or for your priority sites. Um, what do these things mean to the community? You know, what are their memories from here? Why is this project and area so important for them? Uh, something else that's really important is keeping the community involved and informed throughout the whole life of the project. Um, talk about not only um, how you will keep them informed and involved, but also how often. So um, there are tons of ways to keep the community involved and keep them up to date on what's going on. A few of these ideas are, you know, publishing little updates, um, you know, some type of, you know, books or other other public publications talking about um, the projects or the overall work that's being done. Host exhibits or public open houses. Have ongoing public input meetings. Put temporary or, you know, pop up in installations at sites to uh, get the community excited about what's going to happen there. Um, attend other community meetings and provide updates and information at those meetings. So. Don't, don't make people come to you, go to them. That's a really great way to, to uh, you know, get the community involved and informed is to actually go to them. Um, some of the key things to keep in mind are um, stakeholder investment and involvement. So you can build ownership and buy-in from stakeholders by giving them roles and responsibilities. So make them a part of the process. Um, plus this can really take a lot of things off of your plate. 
um, I, you know, we've all we've all got a lot going on, right? So being able to delegate is really helpful. Um, I just mentioned a few ways you can communicate progress, but it's important to remember that you make sure all communication is relevant, timely, and really important, make it interesting. Um, and celebrate all your successes, you know, have events to celebrate any key milestones. This is a really important um, and fun way to keep the community involved and to showcase progress throughout the life of the project. Um, you know, when you talk about the how often should you do these things, you don't, in your grant, you don't really need to get too specific with this, but you should say something like, you know, we will hold one stakeholder meeting per quarter, or we will have one event after each type of this milestone, something general like that. All right, a few other things to consider. Um, form close relationships with key stakeholders and community partners and let them take that information back to the community members or um, you know, ask them to get the input from the community and bring it back to you. So I've found this to be a very effective method of distributing information and getting feedback from the, the bigger community. Um, this has the added benefit of helping to build trust with the, the community as a whole, because the information is coming from someone they already have a relationship with and they already trust. You know, a lot of these um, underserved communities, they may have a real general distrust of governmental entities um, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, so um, they may be otherwise really reluctant to get involved in the process, but but having this come from a trusted member in their community um, is, a, is a really great way to get them started. And as they come to, to trust you more and realize that you're serious about helping them and helping them advance their interests, not your interests, um, then it becomes easier and they're more willing to, to um, you know, give you the assistance that you need. Um, when providing written communications, make sure that they're in multiple languages based on the demographics of the target area. So that may not just be English and Spanish. You know, that, that's kind of in, in Houston, that was the real kind of the default English and Spanish. Um, but you know, there are pocket communities that, you know, maybe, you know, French is the is the other major major language, or maybe it's Mandarin or you know, whatever. So know your demographics and make sure that you're putting written communication out in the majority languages that are in that area. Um, also make sure you're communicating in non-technical and easy to understand terms. All right. Um, so you can also mention in this section um, that sites that are, are enrolled in LDEQ's voluntary remediation program, that's a special program for the uh, phase two environmental site assessments. Um, they're required to have a 30 day public comment period um, on the proposed cleanup plan. So that's a great way to show that you're gonna solicit community um, involvement. Um, just contact me if you want more details on this and I can uh, let you know what it entails and how to phrase that. And then another great resource for community engagement is KSU tab. So, Here's a list of some of their services that they can provide uh, to local entities to help with brownfield outreach. These are all free. Uh, they are funded from a grant from EPA in order to provide these services. So uh, they can help with things like reuse visioning workshops, uh, which actually help solicit community input, uh, you know, assistance with environmental justice issues. So they can help with this as well. Um, Scott, who is our uh, our moderator for this is the KSU contact for Region 6. Um, so you can contact him if you are interested in incorporating some of this into your application. Um, and the, uh, the link to the webinar that, um, that Jen mentioned uh, with additional ideas on community involvement is in the next steps and useful links document. So uh, the summary for this part of it, uh, develop your plan to communicate progress. Uh, make sure you're including soliciting feedback, considering that feedback and responding to it. Uh, make sure to focus on uh, the area, your target area community. Um, use your project partners and get creative about this. EPA loves to see when you're doing more than, you know, just hosting a community meeting that hardly anybody attends, you know. How are you going to actively engage them, attract them to that meeting or show up at their meeting or really get creative on how to get their, the community's feedback? 
So the next steps, uh, um, develop your community outreach plan. Uh, again, make sure you're informing them, you're soliciting feedback, considering that feedback. Uh, make sure to include the frequency and the methods in that. Uh, and make sure to utilize your project partners. That's what they're there for. Um, so make sure you're, you're incorporating them into uh, this part of your application. All right, so that takes us to the end of part two. Sorry that we went a little bit over. Um, so uh, wrapping things up, are there any questions on that last subsection? or really any of the information we covered today or in the previous webinars. Um, we'd like to hear from you on some ways you plan to um, connect or already connecting with the community, um, either in your target area or in general, like let's share ideas on that. Um, one note as people are typing things in, um, I was once told by somebody with EPA that Louisiana folks, we basically identify a problem, come up with a solution, implement that solution, and then move on without a lot of fanfare. Um, so basically, we do a lot of great things, but we're not good at telling other people outside the state about our struggles or about our successes. Um, so this application, especially these first two sections, part one and part two, um, this is where you really need to highlight um, both the struggles of your community and your successes uh, in the state, in your target area, in your municipality, um, and to really drive home how if EPA provides this little nugget of funding, you know, here's all the great things that we can accomplish it with it. So make sure, again, as we have, we're going to reiterate over and over, make sure to tell your story, uh, make sure that it flows well, um, and lay it all out there so you can give your, your best case for why you need this funding and all the great partners you have in place and the resources you have to make this um, a successful program. So Scott, uh, any questions or comments? No, nobody's put anything in the chat box. Um, are we pretty much done except for the summary and some questions? Because if so, I'll go ahead and unmute everybody in case. Yes. I discuss, okay. Yep. So if anybody's still muted, that's on your end. Otherwise, um, go if you want to just discuss things as opposed to using the chat box. All right, then I'm just going to go ahead and do the next steps review. If you do have any questions, go ahead and type those in uh, and we can catch them at the end. But just in the interest of time, we're just going to go through the review real quick. So again, uh, next steps review for uh, finishing up part one, uh, brainstorm your ideas for your leverage resources uh, and then add those leverage resources to your priority sites table. Make sure to check out EPA's Brownfields program, uh, the federal programs guide for some ideas. Uh, you want to list out what existing infrastructure your projects are going to utilize in your priority sites table. And then uh, think through if there's any infrastructure improvements that might be needed uh, based on your planned reuses. Anything that's going to really stand out as you're, you're going to need more broadband or more sewer or something like that. Then for uh, 2AI, you want to uh, choose your geography and add demographic information to your uh, target area demographic table to get that backup data for that to demonstrate either your small population and or your low income population of your target area. And if you're a coalition, just remember to include every target area and each coalition member to show why they don't have uh, the resources necessary to carry out um, environmental assessments and cleanups. And then you're going to write out your sob story. So remember, don't hold back in this section. Uh, make sure why do you need this funding more than any other community. Uh, and then make sure to add additional data and information that might help demonstrate your need. Um, then you're going to make a list of the sensitive populations in your target area and add those related statistics to your demographic table so you have them handy for your narrative. Uh, for the health and welfare threats, you want to pick out one or two health struggles and 
if you can, one or two uh, welfare struggles for each target community. Uh, make sure you have the data and the studies to back up those struggles and then define how this grant is going to help with those specific issues. Uh, under greater than normal incidence of disease and adverse health conditions, uh, refer back to the health effects of the contamination that you mentioned in part one uh, from your priority sites and then gather statistics on the health effects of those in your target area um, or do it the opposite way. Look at the health issues in your community and see if brownfields might be the cause. Uh, and then define again how this grant is going to help with those. And then three, your, talk about your disproportionately impacted population. So um, try to define maybe one to three environmental justice issues in your target area, as well as some operations or policies that might impact them. Uh, and then how this grant is going to help address those. Uh, for your project partners, you want to make a list of your current project partners, uh, identify any gaps in those and kind of help uh, fill them, fill them in. Now's a great time to build those relationships. You want to define their roles, being clear and concise, and then start drafting your project partner table uh, to clearly communicate that information to EPA. Uh, you also want to develop your community outreach plan. Uh, remember, you want to inform the community you, and you want to solicit, consider, and respond to their feedback. Make sure to include those frequency and the methods of communication uh, and include your project partners in this. If you said that they were going to help with outreach, uh, then they should be included in your outreach plan. All right. So our upcoming webinars, that kind of brings us to the end for the first two. These were the big ones. I promise the next two will not be quite as long. So July 9th, we're going to go over task descriptions, cost estimates, and measuring progress. Uh, and then July 30th, that'll be the final section on programmatic capability and past performance. Um, and then once the RFA comes out, we'll do one probably in August or early September to go over any changes in the RFA, just to make sure you're aware of what the new guidelines are requesting. All right, and here's our contact information. If you do have any questions in, in between, uh, please feel free to contact us. We're happy to help. Um, we really want to see uh, more Brownfield funding coming to Louisiana. Um, so we are all happy to help you with your application and, and getting started early so you have a running head head start uh, for when the request for application comes out. All right, Scott, any other additional questions or anything else you want to add? I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you, Dalio, that stuck with us all the way to the end. Uh, and hopefully you have a good weekend and have a good understanding of the community needs section. Uh, and good luck with your application.